very I, much. I, um, uh, Kelly is unable to be here today, so we uh, are. Uh, yeah. Um, she okay? She's fine. Um, you, you know how people have other lives and other things they need to do or whatever, and so it's sort of that. Um, so we're. Um, one of the things that we were sort of looking at is in terms of um, child protection and, and, for lack of a better term, chins reform. And uh, um, there have been uh, people who, who have been in the business for a while, people who've retired from the business, um, who have thoughts. And the first person is Bill Young, who's the former commissioner of what was then SRS. Um, and then followed by Larry <coughs> Post, who is the executive director of the Vermont Parent Representation Center. We all got a report and to hear more about that in terms of suggestions and areas of concern. Um, followed by uh, Christine Johnson from DCF to sort of round out the different perspectives for them. We've got about an hour for that, so I would ask um, the first two people, um, Bill and Larry, to keep that in mind so that Christine has on time as well. So, Bill. Hello, Chair, that was the committee. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, uh, for, for the record, my name is William Young. Um, uh, I appreciate coming. Opportunity to testify this evening about my concerns. And I'm going to ask you to speak up because while you think you the microphone, that's only for um, the copy and not for the people in the back. I can do that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my comments this morning are based on my 20 years of experience as a district director and uh, the last 18 as, as a commissioner of social and rehabilitation services, uh, now reorganized as DCF. Um, as well as my work to understand the report of the Vermont Parent Representation Center. Um, my own work in the past has been driven by an understanding of the uh, abuse and neglect that happens to some of our state's children, some of it horrific, uh, as we all know, I think. Um, our responsibility to protect them and to work with parents in trouble, also knowing that many children are able to remain in their homes or return there. Um, as in any child protection system, Actions must not be just the requirements of law, but also ethical standards, fairness, honesty to all involved, and an understanding of the most awesome power, I believe, exercised by any state is the power of separating children from their parents. And I know we don't have that penalty, but as a parent, I would still say the most awesome power is that the state exercises is to separate kids uh, from their parents. And I, I did that a lot. Um, but it was always with an understanding of just how, how significant that was when we have to do it. Um, I, I don't work for the center and was in fact not aware of its existence until Larry Chris uh, called me and asked my position about taking um, the, his, the position that I could, did, ultimately took against my advice um, of, uh, of, executive, of the executive director of the Vermont Parent Representation Center. Um, I didn't have anything to do with writing the report or advising Larry about it. I'm speaking to you today about my own concerns and recommendations. Obviously, Larry speaks for himself. Um, Larry did work for me as director of the SRS licensing division many years ago. Uh, we kept up in touch once every maybe two, two to five years, have lunch and catch up. Um, I didn't support his taking the job, but he took it anyway. <laughs> um, uh, some months later, he asked me to have lunch regarding to talk about his discussions about the problems he was seeing with the system. I met with him. The concerns were troublesome, but I told him I was retired. I avoided getting embroiled with the goings on in my former former agency. And uh, as a former commissioner, my default was, my default position was to support the department and the commissioner. Um, when the report was published, Larry contacted me and sent me a copy, wanting to uh, meet and discuss it. Uh, I read the report, I developed my own little list, which I, I think I sent everybody, um, of the seven findings that I thought were the most serious. Um, I found them to be unbelievable, frankly. Uh, 
kids separated from their parents with incomplete investigations or no investigations, parents coerced into placing their kids with somebody else um, without a court hearing. Social workers lying in the court and affidavits are providing skewed information and so judges and judges. Lack of due process and appeal to DCF and services for children and necessarily placed in custody more. It is unbelievable. Um, so I went home and thinking about it, realized that in the last couple of years, two families have come to me and asked for advice who were they were involved with DCF. And um, their experiences, my inquiries, uh, match two of the major findings on my list. So it, it still seemed beyond belief. Uh, so I went back to Larry and said, I don't believe this. Prove it. Um, prove it to me that you're not just repeating your complaints of a bunch of parents trying to avoid their responsibility for their actions. Uh, and over the course of about a month or so, we met, talked on the phone, and emailed each other. And he did prove it to my satisfaction. Um, um, and has continued to do that to this day. Well, he has no authority to compel information from DCF or um, to compel records. Many of these findings don't require that kind of authority. Um, if you have a substantiation or a court affidavit that makes a particular statement of fact, in many cases you can go out yourself and verify whether that statement is true or not. And if it's not, the conclusion is pretty straightforward. Um, so he's worked very hard not to take anything for granted to be able to demonstrate the truth of his findings. And I found in my discussions that he's also not a pushover for parents. He's quite capable of saying to, saying to a parent, you know, look, you know, you're living with a sex offender. You're never, I wouldn't give you your children back. Uh, you're an addict. You committed to going to treatment, and, and you're still using. Nobody's going to place you. You're a single parent. Nobody's going to place your kids back with you until you get yourself straight. So he's not. Um, uh, easily taken in, as sometimes people do not tell you the truth. Um, this gets me to my main point this morning. I don't, I don't think I need to, you know, re redo the, the seven major findings. I, I already said I'm talking with some of you about. Um, uh, but I know that Larry gave a copy of the report to, uh, to the commissioner and met with them. No results that he knows of. Two meetings were scheduled with the former Secretary of Human Services and were canceled with the promise of a third that was never held and never heard from him again. A copy was sent to the governor and an offer to meet. There was no acknowledgement. Um, and, uh, and, you know, he, he testified with a couple of committees. Um, uh, he met, I met with several legislators during the session and since then. Um, and, you know, there's been no action to specifically address the, the, those, my seven concerns or his report that I know of. Um, uh, I, I had two very lengthy meetings with Representative Pugh, which I greatly appreciate. And of course, we're here today asked, asked to talk. But this has been a topic of discussion since November. To my knowledge, I think I'm the only person in Vermont that's gone back to Larry and said, I don't believe this stuff. You prove it to me. Um, and as I've thought about it, because it troubles me, <laughs> the only reason I can think of it that action hasn't been taken is like me, people, people don't believe it. Um, it is pretty unbelievable, so I can't be critical of you or anybody else, uh, you know, uh, uh, around action. I didn't believe it. So really, my strong recommendation to you today since it's not very efficient for a large group of legislators to go there individually and say, prove it, <laughs> um, is to immediately act to find somebody independent of DCF in the administration to go to him and essentially say, prove it. You show me the cases. Um, uh, because a lot of that work has been, I found, has been done by him. Um, uh, you know, show me how you verified them. I'll talk to the sources myself directly or review them if necessary. Um, hearings, I think, which is the usual legislative way of getting at facts and matters, I, I think only leaves you with a he said, she said. It's very difficult as a group to ascertain what's, what's really going on. Um, uh, I recommend an independent review, not to disparage Commissioner Schatz or Deputy Commissioner Johnson, who's New in the job, but to her credit, has reached out both to myself and Larry independently to talk with us. Um, 
But these are serious charges. It's just not credible to expect the department to investigate itself or oversee an, an investigation. Um, it took me about 20 or so hours over about a month. Um, I took Larry's word for some things that you would probably want somebody to go, go out themselves and verify. Uh, you know, for example, there's a, I don't want to take up a lot of time on this, but there's a, one of my examples was of a mother's little kid came home with a bruise. And I won't go into the detail about that, you've got it, but, um, but uh, you know, nobody talked to the school. It was supposedly it was a slutty accident at school, that's what she told her mother. Um, uh, it played out in a different way in you know, substantiation of the child into custody for a while. Uh, three weeks before foster homes. So Larry, she went to Larry, he says, anybody talk to the school? No. Went to the nurse. She said, what are you talking about? She heard herself study. I brought her to me. I saw her, but I guess I kind of goofed. I didn't, I didn't tell the mother. It didn't seem like a big deal. Um, I took his word for it that he talked to the nurse. You would probably want somebody to go out themselves and talk to her to verify. So that's really my only point. So it would probably take a little longer than it took me, but I don't think. I, don't, I used to think this would take a lot of time. I don't think it would necessarily. So, so Bill, you said you had seven recommendations for us. And uh, they're attached to my testimony, which I, I just got the notice uh, I was not available for the last two days. So I have a copy of that for the committee of my testimony and those and those seven But can you, can you go through those quickly? Oh, OK. Um, Maybe yeah, I can just quickly finish up and then okay. go through those with you. Okay, yeah. I, think, I think it should take me about 10 or 15 minutes. 10 minutes. Yeah. OK. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Uh, I said earlier the power of the state is the most, to separate kids and families is the most awesome power that we can exercise in this country, I think, and in this state. We recognize that government power uncontrolled, unchecked, sooner or later is always abused. <laughs> I believe that. So, you know, like other states and other areas, we've put in place checks and balances to control that. Um, if these things are true, it means that that system of checks and balances is not working as well as we would want it to. Um, and with the disastrous impact on, on families, on the budget, and potential liability for the state. Um, one lawsuit has been filed already. It wouldn't surprise me if there are more. Um, so the essential step is to immediately act to prove or disprove this. Um, I don't recommend what sometimes is often done, which is to conduct some kind of a punitive review to identify faults and point fingers and punish people. Um, I think we got to this point through a cascading, in my opinion, series of events and decisions, some of which were beyond anyone's control, with other decisions made for very good reasons, with perhaps some unintended consequences that couldn't, couldn't necessarily have been foreseen. Um, uh, my only exception to that is, is if there's instances where people have specifically lied in affidavits to the court, that's a crime that ought to be dealt with like that. That, that I have a hard time turning a, turning a kind eye to. Um, so just to, just to, to quickly end and go to those seven uh, concerns. Um, uh, I was pointing out, there, there are two of them, uh, uh, when I go through these, I can mention two of them, but I think regardless of what you do, they, they really call out for immediate action. Um, the concerns, I, I felt were the, it's a long report. Um, uh, I tried to pull out what I thought were most important. Uh, the first one was that there were cases where investigations were not fully completed or not performed, but children were removed. Also, where parents were coerced to place their children somewhere, like if you don't place your children, uh, you know, with your mother or with somebody else, I'll have to take them into custody. But it means kids are being moved without a court judge having a look at that. That's being done. Um, uh, second, in commissioners reviews of the Human Service Board appeals of substantiations where parents are supposed to be getting a fair hearing. Um, the numerous instances of hearing officers having private conversations with DCF staff, often the parents don't know about. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But in many cases, they don't know what, what was said um, and with no opportunity to rebut it. And uh, there was a Supreme Court case about a year and a half ago when Justice Robinson wrote a footnote to it that said this action just has to stop. Uh, it doesn't need standards of due process. 
but it's uh, still continuing. And, and that, I believe, was a common practice almost in many cases, there's no doubt about it. Um, uh, there are the cases where positive information about a parent was uh, uh, not mentioned in substantiation proceedings or affidavits for the court and child removal proceedings. Um, or, uh, or where you know, there are cases of false statements. Um, uh, really, misstating things is almost just as bad. Um, if you have a, 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 a 35 year old mother who, who, in the course of an interview, told the social worker um, it, it requested a perfectly normal request about giving a problem with alcohol or other drugs, yes, 17 years old. I got addicted, I became a mess for two years to, to alcohol and other drugs. And I got myself in recovery through AA. I've been to AA, I'm an AA meeting every day of my life. Um, <coughs> since then, I'm now 35. Um, and uh, I chair my local AA meeting. I, you know, a friend of Bill, she goes to AA meetings and uh, constantly works the program. That's how she's maintained her recovery. What's the affidavit say? Mother has a history of drug abuse or substance abuse problems. You know, it creates, you, you kind of get a sense it's ongoing or off and on. Um, um, uh, a couple more. Um, regarding our true track system, there's lots of cases of social workers threatening parents to apply with family services, ass assessment instructions or plans or face transfer to an abuse and neglect track and possibly be substantiated and have problems with with custody. Um, I know that the law specifically says refusal to agree with the plan may not be just by itself a reason for transfer, but it seems to me that there's a, um, that's a gap that's being driven through all the time. I was told, I called somebody because of one of the families I was working with, I didn't understand the system just after I left. And in the course of the conversation, I was describing conversations with the family that had asked me for help, for my advice. And this, this is a person in a position at DCF to really understand the system. And they said to me, look, Bill, sounds like you gotta get your folks have a young worker, you know, maybe not very good, but tell them not to get angry at her or get in her face about this so they'll find themselves transferred over the abuse of the left track. It happens all the time. So I, I believe that. Um, um, there are instances of children being taken into custody and placed in a foster home when competent relatives were willing to take care of them. And it seems that there's a concern that, you know, that frequently there's not the attention paid to that that, that uh, is expected of us. Um, and finally, it's a, it seems to be a, a circle of Reagan's culture. There's been some real tough cases over the last you know, decade. Um, uh, of us versus them, we're often too often parents are seen as the enemy uh, before an investigation is concluded, sometimes to be feared. It's a very dangerous culture in this business because, uh, you know, when I was commissioner, we only substantiated about 46% of the investigations. I looked at the 2017 DCF report, I think they substantiated 28% of the cases. Different systems, so it's not good care. But, uh, but nevertheless, you're dealing with a lot of families that uh, have their kids and in many cases, you don't substantiate abuse. Um, uh, so it's a, it's a, uh, I can understand perhaps how that could develop um, given the variety of circumstances over the years, but it's a dangerous culture. If you have people saying, we don't have to do an investigation, we know who these people are. That's a, that's a problem. Um, and uh, if, if these, these things are real, the impact on the state's budget is significant, and perhaps some of the questions about numbers of kids in custody, for example, um, uh, can be seen in a different light if, if you're able to prove or, or if you're able to prove these, or, or, or disprove them. But I really think it's important. I don't see how you can move forward without something to your satisfaction. You know, is this, is this, are these things real or not? That's my nice testimony. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And are you going to get the testimony um, to the yes. so we yes. can have yes. it electronically? I, I, I saw it about 8 o'clock last night. Okay. 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 Right. Thank you. I apologize and thank you for being um, so flexible and coming. Sure.
Good morning and thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is Larry Chris. Uh, I won't go into my background. I know everyone on the panel. I have a lot of miles under my belt, so to speak. So there really aren't many secrets in this room. Um, in the interest of time, I, I'm going to summarize the, the testimony that you have a copy of. And I think that um, that summary also includes a couple of things on the, fir on the front end. First is I want to thank the new deputy commissioner for reaching out to me and, and agreeing to actually offering to meet with me. And I'll note that she is the first DCF manager in three and a half years, including the year that this report has been present, who has made that offer and followed through. So she should be commended for that. The second is, in all deference to my friend Marshall Paul, I'm going to say some nice, not nice things about his program, but it has no reflection upon Marshall because he does the very best that can be done under the circumstances that he works. <sighs> Ten months ago, we identified 60 problems in the system and 80 recommendations. Right, can I just ask you one yeah. question because sure. everyone does not know? Um, can you outline the, the staffing and who is the Parent Representation sure. Center? Sure. Parent Rep Representation Center Incorporated. It's a Vermont-based nonprofit based out of Burlington, operates statewide, and has been in operation for roughly 10 years now. Uh, my predecessor was a woman by the name of Trina Beck, um, who served mm -hmm. as the one of the founders and the executive director. Staffing has changed over that 10-year period. In the early days of the, of the program, um, it staffed with an attorney and a social worker, um, plus a board that was an active board. <clears throat> in the middle section, when I first came on board, it continued with an executive director, an attorney, and social service personnel assistant. I currently am the only full-time staff person. We have several volunteers who work with me and board members in their, in their capacity as attorneys um, and social service personnel. Okay, do it? Yeah. Okay. Um, of the 80 recommendations, I'm going to focus on one. One recommendation. And that has to do with parent and child defenders. Um, Vermont's current system of providing defense counsel for parents and to a lesser extent for children is beyond abysmal. It is terrible. And the reason it's terrible is because the payment scheme for contract uh, attorneys, who are the people who provide, for the most part, parent representation, um, pays them too little for too much work. As an example, the ABA standard their goal standard for this kind of work is 60 cases a year with social service support. I have yet to meet a contract attorney who had less than a couple of hundred of these cases in Vermont. What that, what that equates to is most of the people that I work with and have worked with for three and a half years, and I've engaged roughly 400 to 450 families in that three and a half year period, almost never meet with their attorneys, other than for a couple of minutes just before they go into court. The majority of these attorneys don't have the time to file motions. They don't have the time to understand the cases. They don't have the time to contest the information that's presented. And as a result, the entire system has become sloppy. DCF writes sloppy affidavits. No one challenges them. The state's attorneys don't have the ability to discern truth from fiction when they're reviewing whether to go forward um, with a Chen's case. Judges have to work with the information they're given, and if no one contests it, then the judge has to accept it. We get bad outcomes. What we typically get is attorneys who tell their parents, because it's the best job the attorney can do, given the amount of time and resources they have, do what DCF tells you to do, and you'll get your children back. That is a lie. It does not work that way. It is not because there are bad people in the system, it's because the system itself is bad. It does not work. And we have great examples now that we can use, and we have an opportunity to change this system. Washington State has a system in which there are dedicated parent defenders and dedicated children's defenders. They work with supervision, they work with performance measures, they work with adequate salaries, and they work with support. 
their outcomes are dramatically better than our outcomes. More recently, this year, well, yes, this year, the city of New York completed a 10 year, a four year study working with 10,000 families using a system very comparable to what it is that happens in Washington State and the system that we have proposed in our report. Those outcomes are, and here's the first outcome, kids who need to be adopted are adopted faster. In our system today, kids get adopted. We can't say whether it's faster or slower or anything else. What we know is that our system does not adequately represent the parties and many of the adoptions occur simply because cases have gone on too long. If you go back and look at the files, that's what you find. It's not that the parents didn't do what they were supposed to do. It's not that the department didn't do what it was supposed to do. It's that too much time passed. Why did it pass? Because we have delay after delay after delay. Cases go on for two years that should have been resolved in a matter of months. <clears throat> we have an opportunity with the federal government's change in the Social Security Act, Title IV-E. They are now, the federal government is now going to make new federal dollars available for the state of Vermont to be able to access that money and for the very first time, that money can be used for the creation of dedicated parent defense programs and dedicated children's defense programs. It's there, it's an opportunity. There are complications. Are you, are you talking about the Family First Prevention money? Family First Prevention. Okay, just that, you know, yes. you just read that. Right. But I will add this. There is a complication that's been raised of saying, well, the feds want certain things done with the money. When you look closely at the Family First legislation, it doesn't affect this program. You don't have to do this program based on money that's going to be shared with other programs. There is an opportunity here for us at a 50-50 match basis to dramatically improve our system. We will get faster resolution of cases. We will get more accurate resolution of cases. And we will have things that we can actually look at and measure and say, are we doing better or are we doing worse? I would be happy to talk at greater length about this. Time doesn't allow it in this context. So the second piece of this is, in addition to creating those dedicated people to work on the Chins cases, those same individuals should be charged with representing parents in substantiation hearings. In today's system, any one of you can be substantiated on the word of a DCF investigator and a supervisor. That investigator may have two years experience. Supervisor may have four or five years experience. The system is set up so that you basically have to prove you didn't do it, not that the state has to prove that they did it. You will be granted an opportunity after the substantiation has been proposed to appeal that to the department. The statute you created gives the department 30 days within which to hold that, that review. Right now, reviews are happening between nine and 14 months after your substantiation. If you are a social worker and you are substantiated, you cannot practice. If you're a teacher, you cannot practice. If you're a medical professional, you cannot practice. Then when you get to the hearing, you don't have an attorney to assist you with the hearing. You're provided with a redacted investigation report that usually runs 12 pages, six pages of which are totally redacted. When I review those reports with parents, I can't tell you what happened. I can't even tell you what's alleged. I can't tell you what the evidence is. But you're supposed to be able to defend yourself. You then get a hearing with the Human Services Board. And people look at that and say that's due process. Well, it is due process, except that it follows the Vermont Rules of Evidence. Any attorneys on the board here who would be able to say this is what the rules of evidence are? Not likely. Do you know what it costs to hire an attorney to, to go to the Human Services Board? Between five and $15,000 for your hearing. Most of the people we work with do not have those kinds of resources. Now, the reason it's important that attorneys are assigned to work, I have taken the first six cases of clients we work with. I didn't cherry pick, I took the first six cases that came forward of people who had commissioner reviews coming up. In three of them, I had gotten them reversed because the department had no evidence. There was a substantiation, it didn't match the statute, or there was no evidence presented. In two of them, 
they have been sent back to the department for reinvestigation because I was able to provide a witness list that said, here are seven people who were presented as a witness. None of them were ever interviewed. Or, here are five people who were presented as witnesses. One was interviewed, but they now have made a statement that what is said about what they said is not true. One I've lost. That one is on appeal. And based on a decision in <coughs> Washington County Criminal Court yesterday, that one's going to be overturned also because there is no evidence that there ever was abuse of a child. These kinds of cases ruin people's lives. There is one client I'm working with who was a state employee, the sole support for five children. She has been substantiated. She's been terminated from her job because of the substantiation. Her children went into custody for a period of of time. She had no income. She lost her housing. And guess how she survives today? She's a welfare mother. The substantiation was overturned. But it took a year to do that. Her life is wrecked. You know, this is not helping families. By creating a dedicated group of attorneys who focus on this kind of work, it will give people like Marshall Paul a tool to actually be able to effectively represent people on a consistent basis. Because there are some attorneys who do phenomenal work. There are some attorneys who when I hear that they've been assigned to a case, I light up. Because I know that they are going to do a very good job. They may not win, but they will do a good job. And that's what this is really about. The last thing I would like to do is... You've got time. Okay. Same. I'd like to tell you a story. You will see several stories in here, but, but I'd like to tell you a story. Teenage mother gives birth. She and the father are described as being overly nervous by DCF as they begin to learn how to breastfeed. I don't know about any of you, but I was overly nervous when I got involved with my first child, and I wasn't doing the breastfeeding, and I was not a teenager. DCF petitioned the court for emergency custody based on nervousness of the mother and the mother's quote-unquote long history with child protection agencies. That's what went to the judge. That's what the judge saw. That's what the state's attorney saw. The infant, <coughs> the infant is placed into custody. It's placed in a foster home, a pre-adopted foster home with parents who had no interest in seeing reunification because their interest was in adopting the child. Mother and father are granted five-day-a-week visitation with the infant, which is really nice, except it's a two-hour round trip each way, round trip, for them to do their visitation five days a week during the winter using public transportation. They do this for seven months. Seven months later, at the conclusion of the merits hearing, the judge rules that there was absolutely no reason for DCF to have taken this infant from its parents in the first place. That's what the judge said from the bench. But it took seven months to get to that point. The reason it took seven months? The parents had to fire the first two appointed attorneys because they did nothing except tell the parents to, quote, agree with DCF, do what they say, and you will get your child back. And even these teenagers were smart enough to know that wasn't going to happen. Seven months of separation from their infant. Seven months lost forever, solely because a dysfunctional state agency thought a teenage mother appeared nervous while learning to breastfeed and a mother having a long history with child protection. That was a euphemism. Anybody know what the euphemism was for? She had been a foster child. That was her long history with child protection. Attorneys who had virtually no contact with them, but they were smart enough to terminate them, which they can do under the current system. And then they were fortunate enough to have two attorneys appointed who actually looked at the case, realized this is insane, adequately represented them, and they walked out of the court with their child. But it wasn't a newborn anymore. It was a seven-month-old child. To our knowledge, no one not a supervisor, not a director, or anyone else in DCF found this egregious. 
and never an apology or acknowledgement of what UCF had done. That's my testimony, folks. The report speaks for itself. I have hundreds of these stories. You can see three or four of them in my written submission here. The system we have today does not work. There are too many things broken in it, but one way to begin a fix <coughs> is to move to the point of giving adequate representation to both parents and children. That's the only thing. It's the only check and balance. There's no other check and balance in this system because there's no one else responsible for it. It's not just DCF. It's the court system. It's the Defender General's office. It's the state's attorneys. There is no one in charge of that system. These attorneys can hold the system accountable, and they can speak truth to power. That's it. Thank you. I so appreciate it. Um, Larry, um, the person who testified before had about eight, had seven, had seven recommendations. So you had, you started to say 80 recommendations, there are and you're giving one. one. So um, the report outlines all eight. Well, um, you are here to perhaps pick out a few more that you think um, are? There needs, okay, I'll be happy to point out to you. There needs to be some oversight body. The system that we have in operation today is, is just shrouded in confidentiality. And I'll give you a quick example of how that works. If you're involved in a Chins case and you're the parent and your attorneys don't represent you well, or there is information that's provided that simply isn't true, never was true, and because of that, you wind up losing the Chins case and you lose, wind up losing custody of your child. The moment that Chins case is closed, no one has access to that file. If you decide, wait a minute, there were lies that were told that weren't true, you can't get access to your file. The confidentiality was designed to protect children. That's not the way it works. It protects everyone who works in the system. And I know because I've made requests for parents' files and been told, sorry, you can't have them. The law doesn't allow you to have them. There is no way to look at DCF's work except to take DCF's word for it. And any system that is based entirely on the honor system, even if it's West Point, we know doesn't work. It just doesn't work that way. So some kind of oversight entity there is no way to track complaints that are available for a body to look at and say, okay, there are 500 complaints that have come in. 250 of them are about the same thing. Maybe we should be looking at whatever that same thing is. Our office really serves that purpose. Since the announcement of a lawsuit that had been filed in federal court two months ago, I received over 90 phone calls from families. I don't mean multiple calls from the same family, I mean 90 different families. Granted, a number of them are people who, whose cases, who knows whether the right thing or the wrong thing was done. A few of them I know the right thing was done. <laughs> but there are far too many who say, I read that lawsuit. That's what happened to us. That's exactly what happened to us. Our attorneys never met with us once. The affidavit, there was nothing in the affidavit that was true. And I can believe that because I've read hundreds of affidavits now. Because as long as the Chins case is open, the parents have access to that information. And when we meet with them, they share that information with us. There just is no check and balance. Uh, there, is no, there seems to be no system of accountability within the system because of confidentiality. You can't hold people accountable if you can't look at what their work is. Yes, I want to make two comments and then I do have some questions, but mm -hmm. this is all very familiar. I mean, Bill Young was the commissioner of SRS when we had similar complaints about the system. Um, we are a small state with inadequate, inadequate resources to try to deal with some of these problems. I, this is our staff right here, and they report to 180 legislators. We don't have the power to investigate DCF. We don't even have the ability to do it, even if we had the power. So we look at things, and we have to trust the administration, the courts, and our state's attorneys 
the defense bar and all to protect people's concerns. I worked in the system for 35 years, maybe it's longer. I have to figure that out someday. <laughs> um, and you did too, Larry. Uh, Bill did. It seems to me that we have certain individuals who don't do a good job, and we have certain individuals who would do a great job. When we looked at the uh, what started this committee, the, was the deaths of two toddlers, and when we looked into deeply into those deaths, we saw a system that was inadequate, but also a, a, an office in Rutland. To, to a great extent, that just didn't do the things right. How do we, you know, you talk about oversight and all, but how do we, you know, not just create another layer of mm -hmm. bureaucracy on top of, to, to investigate the investigators, how, how do we not create another layer of bureaucracy that'll be the same? We go along, we say, oh, yeah, we did a wonderful job. And now DCF, is afraid to take kids out of a home when it's appropriate, and then the kid dies, and we say, oh, DCF, it's your fault. Ken Schatz, Bill Young. I would, I would offer a solution, Senator. Thank you. And that is that when DCF believes in its wisdom that a child is in danger and should be removed, they should have to prove it. <coughs> And they should have to prove it in a setting in which the parents are equally represented. So that there actually is a real connection of here is the, here is the issue and here is the other side of that issue. Now, in an open and <laughs> closed court in this instance, then a judge can in fact look at something and say, okay, I've seen this information. I don't believe that we should have removed this child. Or, I've seen this information and absolutely this child should be removed. I would argue, Larry, that's the way the system is supposed to work and I'd like to know why it's not working. I believe it Rather doesn't. than creating another bureaucracy. No, I, I'm not proposing another bureaucracy. What I'm proposing is we have a Defender General Office. They have contracts with individuals. That's the problem. The contract system doesn't work. You cannot pay someone okay as much as $90,000 a year, which sounds like a great deal of money in Vermont, to run a law office, it doesn't work. It do just doesn't work that so way. So do you, you believe that when it's non-contract defense attorneys, that, you know, like in Bennington, there's five or six, uh, I don't know how many you have in Bennington. Five attorneys. Five attorneys. One, and one I that's full-time juvenile. The rest of them, one's full-time juvenile, the rest cover criminal. So they've got attorneys that work for the state. They work for the department general. Right. Is that typically those in mean, training? We, we went around. We found not bragging just because I'm from Bennington, but we found the Bennington office was one of the exemplary offices, reported by foster parents, reported by people who have been in the system. And and I think that there are some areas of the state that work much better, but the reality is that we need to have attorneys who have the time and the compensation and the resources to actually be able to look at each of these cases the same way that I do. I'm one person. No, I I'm, I'm one person, but I take the time to look at these cases and will not take anything for granted. You know, show me, prove to me, let me get the information. If you have five witnesses listed, why weren't those five interviewed? That's an easy question for an attorney to ask but they don't ask it because they don't have time. They want to process these cases as quickly as they can because they're not paid by case. They're paid for a percentage of their time. This system just doesn't work. And when you talk to attorneys who are successful at it, they will tell you that they will not take many of these cases because of how much time they do require. Okay. Well, I mean, I, it gets much more complicated. We don't even have guardian ad litems enough in the system to help the kids who are supposed to be working with the kids. We have an underfunded system, and we have a, a budget that doesn't meet the needs of the criminal justice and juvenile justice system. And, and you know, I, I was in Bennington yesterday 
talking with judges, defense attorneys, probate judge, everyone about cuts to courtroom security because we don't fund it enough. And so we've cut the hours so that the average person can't go into probate court right now at, if they work, past 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They can't get there. And I would I mean, it's, it's a system that, it's a system, my it's frustration, a problem. Larry, is with the, the budgeting process. Judges, you know, all my judges in Bennington travel from Rutland. Now we're going to have one traveling from, from Brattleboro. Why? Because we can't get a, a judge appointed in Bennington. I guess we've got nobody qualified. So I would offer this. The changes in Title 40 allow us to double the amount of money that we are spending now on parent and child defenders without spending any more money. And what I would just add to the... But that's the frustration. I'm right, I'm I mean, I guess, and I would just yeah. add to your frustration, you identify this as the, um, the, the juvenile justice. And I would add that we really are talking about the child protection system as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so we are, you, okay. you talked about judges, we're also talking about the number of um, I was when uh, I say juvenile justice, I'm the whole ball of wax. Yeah, no, I, I get that, and I just mm -hmm. I am focusing we're on the same that. Thing. Yeah, we're saying the same thing, but also talking um, not solely. For, uh, what I am talking right. about is not solely the legal profession, but you are making some um, some statements that relate to um, the quality of service provision that. Um, is being provided and whether that is, and we know that we have what we call an aspirational caseload size um, that has not been met and people even argue about that. And we know, we know from the review that you were talking about um, that one of the bigger issues is community providers and communication. And so across the board, we are talking about immense needs um, and where do we prioritize? And um, with that, I, and with that, we have a question. I actually said a lot of what I was going to say, but so, uh, going back to caseloads, I remember Bill Young coming in, and I sort of ranted a little bit about caseload issues at um, DCF, and that can uh, that for me continues to be a, a problem because if you have busy uh, people, too busy, too much of a workload, then they're not going to go to the witnesses and they're not going to do their job. And so uh, the question is, do we plug the hole uh, down the stream or do we go back up the stream and look to see um, if, we, if we should be doing that? Uh, your, your number one priority seems to be further down and the, where the dam is located. Um, and that's perfectly legitimate. Um, as long as the Title IV funds, um, 4E funds, are continuous. If it's a continuous flow, we can maintain the system. If it's not, it'll we'll fall apart. I haven't asked my question yet. Is it, and I know, I'm gonna ask you to comment on all of this, but, and then finally, um, you've listed a whole lot of things in your key steps. And each of those key steps is a part of the system. And so um, you're talking about systemic change. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to start with systemic change, then wouldn't we want to go upstream first and then move slowly downstream yes. uh, so that when we get to the public defender or the, the family defender, we know what our estimates are? And, and that is an outstanding point with one exception. Uh -oh. It is not upstream where we take people's children. It is downstream where we take their children. If downstream DCF is held to a higher standard of performance, you will see less work upstream. Oh, more work upstream because DCF is going to get tired of having cases sent back. And I will give you one quick example of that. I was asked this past week by a family if I would accompany them to a meeting with DCF where they had had an assessment, there had been nothing found in the assessment, but they were told that because the risk assessment tool rated them a very high risk, that they had to have an open family services case. 
which we know will go from three to six months and will tie up resources. So I said, they found nothing in the assessment. The answer was no. I said, call the district office, ask for the supervisor, tell them that you would like a meeting to discuss the legal basis for them requiring an open family services case and tell them that you'll have a support person coming and it will be me. A few hours later, the mother called me back and said, I got a call from the supervisor who said it was all a mistake. There doesn't need to be a meeting because there won't be an open family services case. The reason there wouldn't be an open family services case is because the law doesn't allow for it. In fact, the law says you can't do it. But, but in the district offices, if you are found to have no problem, then you go through a risk assessment. And if the risk assessment says you're high or very high, then they open a case. That is contrary to Title 33. It's a, it's a workload creator. That technique was supposed to be used on the front end before you decide not to investigate. If you say, no, we're not going to investigate this report, you should do a risk assessment to make sure you're not making a mistake on the front end, not on the back end. You have over a 1,000 open cases and, now. And you are now going into yep. what you, there may be someone else, and this may be part of what, what the senator was talking about, whose assessment of when and how the um, people who work for the state work with families so that their kids are not removed yes. uh, may be different than what you are putting forth. And that's fine. Absolutely. I just, you, you yes. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to um, clearly, um, hi, hi Brenda, <laughs> clearly we're, we're, we're a little late, so mm. we're, this is legislative time. We, we're, we're not getting to you for a bit. Thank you. Uh, um, I appreciate yeah. your time. Thank Oops. you. No, and thank you for your work. And, and uh, <coughs> for me, I see a lot of holes all along the system and, and problems, and we need to focus on each one. And, that, and some of these are, yeah. are one discussions that we have right. during committee discussion, and some of it is in terms of the, the just right now, the recommend some of the recommendations that both you and the prior witness talked about um, are not necessarily always, if they're all important, which right. ones do we do? What is an oversight body? Do we want to have another bureaucracy? Is that a barrier or is that something that in fact can address things? Um, how do we have an independent review so it is not, so it is, um, Per, per, that perhaps is better understood and heard? Um, and where do we put our resources? So we put all of our resources with the Defender General. What about for the families? And what about for the judges? Because I might suggest that some of the issue is not just the Defender General, but in fact, they don't have judges, and the delays are that they don't have space, time, and energy. Right. I, I, thank I, th you. I thank you, I would leave with this last note two things. The first is, I'm not proposing a new bureaucracy. I'm proposing a use of federal funds to bolster the system we currently have, not a new bureaucracy. And the last piece is, the difficulty, I think, for the courts is the same difficulty you have in technology. Garbage in, garbage out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Christine. That wasn't my fault. That took so long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look right at the time. Sorry, uh, uh, <laughs> I, I would be not doing due diligence. Thank you, Christine Johnson, Deputy Commissioner, uh, Department for Children and Families, Family Services Division. Um, I think what I'm going to do is, is respond somewhat to what Larry and Bill um, has just presented, and then also um, going to talk about some other pieces in terms of a child um, protection oversight update, um, and hopefully can hit on some of the points, although I don't know. Um, if I can do the justice, but I'm going to try. Um, first, I would like to say um, I have total agreement with Bill and Larry about the impacts of taking a child into custody and away from their parents. It is something that every single one of us who works in the division lives with every minute of every day. It is what causes trauma, if you will, um, for the people that work in our system who go home and can't sleep with them. So I want to be crystal clear about the impacts. We know the impacts, and we take them very seriously. So 
So all of us desire an optimal child protection system. And I would take it one step further and say, we really want an optimal child welfare system. And we know that this division of family services is one piece of that system. So because we all have the same goals, and that was certainly what drove me to meet with Larry and with Bill. And um, I do have to say, I have a, a, a huge level of respect for their experience, for what they know, and for how they understand the systems. So to that end, how do we get there? How do we fix it? And I think largely that is what you are calling upon us as leaders to do. And frankly, that is a job that we were up to the task to do. You've heard me say that we uh, need certain things to do this work optimally. We need a new data system. We need uh, adequate staffing. And we do know that the 14 positions that were legislated last session are really starting to have that impact. Uh, I will share with you our caseload data That's from October 2nd, and I will tell you for the first time in several years, our caseload is finally adjusted under 15, which is what we are statutorily required to do, and I'm very happy that that is happening. So you can see from the data that we are adjusted at a caseload rate of 14.7, unadjusted, and I'll explain what that means in a second, is 17.9. How we get to those numbers is we take all of the cases, our open cases, and we divide it. Um, unadjusted means it's just simply the number of workers we have divided by the number of um, workers and cases, essentially. And that's how we get to the 14.7. The 17.9, though, takes into consideration when we have new family services workers and they're in their first six months, we don't count them as having a full caseload. We count them as a half FTE. As well as when we have vacancies, we count that as a zero. So the adjusted gets us, I think, to a more realistic perception or re a reality of what, what our family services workers are holding. Um, I will tell you that um, we have been doing our, our road shows, our, our visits with the district offices, and we've gotten through half of them now as of yesterday. And we are starting to hear our staff say that they're starting to feel the effects of having additional staff. And they're starting to feel like caseloads are becoming more manageable. But what I want to caution us about as well, um, as I was just meeting with Middlebury yesterday, and they, their numbers look fantastic at an adjusted 13.3 cases. What I'll tell you is because these are new positions and then they're not fully um, up to speed, uh, they're not necessarily feeling that all across the board. And so I do, I do um, have some level of caution in thinking about where we're getting in our caseloads. I guess my, my, my optimism is that we're getting, in the, we're getting there in terms of the capacity that we have. Because when I was hired, I focused on three specific issues, and I think they were very true for this conversation. And the first is capacity. And I was crystal clear in my interview, and I have been with staff, that, as we've been doing our road shows, about how I perceive my job in helping our staff have the capacity to do their jobs. And so that is why you're gonna hear me continue to say we need a new data system to realize efficiencies and, and be able to... Um, I don't think you're going to have any argument here. I think you need to talk upstairs to um, Yes, I think that's people, right. Because they keep saying five years, <clears throat> and I've been a legislator for more than five years. And I think that's right, but I think the message is that I think we have to recognize, and I've asked staff to send me examples of where they can recognize, where they can realize efficiencies if they had a better data system. As a matter of fact, in conversations that we had last week with Don Winstead, who's doing consultant work on behalf of the Family First um, Services Prevention Act, um, he is crystal clear that the data system that we have is going to be prohibited in terms of realizing family first. So again, another example of how we need to do that. But when I think about what Larry and Bill were presenting in terms of um, some of the issues that we're having in child welfare and our child protection system, I cannot stop saying that we need the tools um, to do the job at the level that is going to help us address these issues. Um, so in terms of capacity, though, it's not just about staff. It's about foster parents. It's about having a continuum of options for youth when they are in their highest needs, whether because they are sex offenders or because they are violent or because they are traumatized at a level that we may or may not have services in Vermont to address. And so we have to think about this in terms of the continuum. Um, I, um, so capacity is a huge issue that we're that I certainly, in my role, am taking very seriously. The second is morale, and as all of you know very well, we had the two toddler deaths, and we had the death of Lara Sobel. And you you know very well the impact that that has had on our system. And we are, I would argue, we are still reeling from that death of a social worker in our system. 
um, is very much alive and well in the minds of every single person that works in our, in our system. So morale is a huge issue. Morale feeds, of course, capacity. It feeds the ability to retain staff. And I want to point out that we have a 25% staff retention rate in Vermont, and we are one of the best in New England. So other states in New England are seeing 65% turnover. We are at 25%, which I would not argue is optimal, but I do find comfort in knowing that we are, despite our challenges, retaining people at a higher level than even some states around us. In terms of uh, the third item being safety, uh, this is a huge, again, it feeds morale, it feeds capacity. We have to have safety for our staff and safety for our kids and our families that we're working with. Um, Senator Sears, your point about security in the building is a very good one because when I was in Hartford last week, I was reminded about um, law enforcement letting us know, uh, state staff know that that building in Hartford is the most unsafe building in all of the town. And um, we have Department of Corrections working there, we have Department for Children and Families there, and we don't have security at the door. And so, again, these issues continue to um, kind of weave together to address some of the challenges that we face in our division. I will say, though, that we are seeing a number uh, of cases of kids in custody drop. Uh, again, for the first time in years. And this includes our family support cases. And so, you know, it's hard to know what to make of that. I do um, hold out hope, though, that what that means is that um, the, the increasing numbers that we've seen over the last several years, potentially in response to the opioid crisis, we're starting to see that turn around. My hope is that that's a result of the medication-assisted treatment that we now have capacity for in the state. Right, it's too, it's too early to know. It's really hard to say. Um, but I do think it's hopeful that we have fewer kids in custody. Um, we, um, I think, in addition to those three things, I, I feel like we, um, I've said this a lot for a long time, we, need, we do need to create a system of prevention in this state. Um, and I think Larry said it really well, that when we're intervening, it is not prevention. It is intervention. And so we have to really think as a system about how we get ahead and how we start working in an environment that has the resources available so that we can start preventing this way upstream. Um, that would certainly be the best case scenario. Um, I do want a family and child-centered system. And there are ways that we can go about doing this. And I think that that's, I, I have to say, I don't think that the work to date so far, to uh, the work that has been done to date, has not been family and child-centered. But, but how do we think about what that means for how we move our work forward? I'd love to see us include youth and family voice at higher levels and ensuring that um, we do have um, youth and family at our tables and we are hearing their voices and, and hearing their concerns and understanding when things don't go right. I'd also like to see us include fathers at a higher level. Um, I don't think we've done that well here. I don't think we've done that well in the country. Um, but really making sure fathers are at the table and that fathers are held accountable and that fathers are expected to be a part of the solution with our families because, let's face it, they make up, you know, certainly 50% of, of the, the duo. Um, in terms of um, the use of our family support cases, I, I know we've had a lot of conversations, at least I have, about, you know, should we be involved in cases with families that are, that, that assess as being high risk. Um, and what the message that I have to share with you today is that I think the answer is yes. And what I want to share with you is that nationally, the country is being held to a standard of um, states that are considered high performing are states that are using the family support cases the most. And what that means is that families are not, children are not coming into, into custody, but families are being worked with as the child remains in the home. And so, um, while there's been a lot of debate about whether or not, um, you know, I've heard the word coercion used today, um, I do think it's a fine line. And when we're working with somebody who has allegedly abused or neglected a child, it's a fine line between how long we um, work with that child in the family and when d does a safety issue arise that that child needs to be taken out of the home. And so that is a fine line that we live with and it is one that we can continue to discuss and improve upon, but I think it's I think that this concept of having our, our open cases with our family support cases is going to be an integral part of the work that we're doing. Um, we know that in New Jersey, Massachusetts, and New York City, um, they, those are three jurisdictions that serve more than 80% of their caseload with in-home services, 80%. 
And we have gone from, I believe, about 40 several years ago to um, right around 500 today. And so I think that that's something that we as a system need to really be proud of and think about. For every open family case that exists, that is a child that we have not had to take into custody. We have not had to remove from their parents. So I also want to point out that um, you know, serving families in this way is the intent of the Family First Prevention Services Act uh, legislation. And that prevention really is the focus of this new pass, path forward. Uh, I also wanted to let you know that we are in the, the um, process of forming a work group that we intend to have a tribe branch um, representation in order to really gear up our implementation and planning around Family First. So will that tribe branch include the legislative branch? Yes, you bet it will. That's, that's one of the tribe branches. Yes. I'm just, I'm just reinforcing that. <laughs> Yes, no, and, and really it's to the point of, of Tim Decker and, and voices at the last hearing talking about, um, you know, really the kind of some of the tenets of family first and thinking about who do we need to have at this table. And so we met this week, I met with Jim Forbes, and we outlined um, who we would want to have at that table, including our congressional delegation and making sure that we have the federal government um, voice at that table. How do the number of kids in custody in Vermont match with, like, Regarding in which? Well, in all of them, you were citing the number. I, I see them in rural, you know, in terms of numbers in custody or right. percentage per capita, per capita numbers in custody. Are we higher? Are we lower? Are we? We are higher. We're higher than <coughs> we actually are one of the highest states in terms of so custody. So you know, I think it's it's incumbent upon us to understand why that is. And, and are they not doing? We have more kids in special ed than those states. Why is it? That I mean, and I think that's some of what the money that I yeah. want to say the two of you um, put in the um, budget, yeah. Jane, okay. that Senator Kitchell did, yeah, Senator. Um, to begin um, an evaluation but, and but looking at it. But I don't know if we know the answers to those questions. Um, we don't. And they're, they're fundamental to understanding how to move forward. And, uh, yeah. We're either really good at it. Well, we're really good, or maybe we're identifying That's what I mean. um, better. kids better, and maybe our out, but our outcomes better. Right. Our kids, you know, better. I mean, we heard mm -hmm. last week or the last time we met about having an ombuds person mm -hmm. um, in an office that was three hundred and something thousand. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this, you know, we, I can't tell you how many times I've sat in appropriations and listened to your problem with IT. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and it doesn't get anywhere. I am well aware of that because the, the legislature, you have to take some responsibility and support, um, has supported the administration's proposal that any federal funds related to um, to match around records has gone to more traditional health care. Yeah. And that has been our priority. No, I, I just say it. Yeah. We I like to point fingers, but we have to look at our own. Yeah. So, so your point is well taken. I mean, we certainly but have. I would like to hear at some point, either in this committee or as a report to other committees. The, the what the real numbers are per capita as compared with Maine and New Hampshire. And then a little bit of looking at why is it that we're taking more kids into custody or fewer kids into custody? Is it because we have more social workers now? I mean, it, you know, there's a, a line about the more cops you put on the street, the more people get arrested, the more people end up in court, the more people end up in jail. So, so um well, and the backup to that is, um, our outcomes are better. Yeah. yeah. And the, the backup to that is, our, our outcomes better. Well, and I would argue, too, that it, it, we're a little different in cops in that we have caseworkers that, or social workers that meet the demand once a report of child abuse and neglect has been right. made. So we're not out looking for business. Business really does come to us, which is a little bit different, you know, in terms of the analysis. Yeah, I, but I'm just trying to yeah. understand. Sure. Yeah. Um, and, and Dick, what I just want in terms of what I understand in terms of the beginning of looking at 
what was um, put into the budget in terms of look, people are not at a place where they can respond and give you the information. They're working on it and um, my hope is that we, in November, that we can have a progress report on where um, that contract and where the work is and when and what we can expect. Um, so can I just add one thing to the um, New Hampshire piece? Uh, obviously they do have a healthcare ombudsman and maybe there's some data that they can share with you about what happened, what, what their numbers were prior to the ombudsman and post ombudsman and if there are other changes that they put in their system. I think it's really difficult to compare systems that are different, but if we can get at a couple of things, that would be really helpful. Yeah, we do that all the time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Mary Beth. Yeah, I had a question about the affidavits um, and the, you know, that process. I have concerns, um, you know, uh, the former witnesses talked about those affidavits really being um, prepared in a way that shows all of the deficits and there being no kind of um, recognition that, you know, there is progress or whatever. And I'm wondering, how do we improve that process? How does that process, how, how do we get a more, how does a judge ultimately end up with a more authentic sense of the case? How could that be improved in the DCF system, in your view? I, you know, I think it, it really gets to training and how are we training? I mean, my question would be, how are we training to write affidavits? Um, how are we retraining? You know, are we, um, once we learn how to write an affidavit, do we have any type of follow-up over time? Um, is where I would go to immediately. I mean, I, I do think it's something worth taking a look at and thinking about, you know, we do want to be a strengths-based mm -hmm. system, um, but I, you know, I think that involves um, kind of having a high level awareness of what that looks like all the time. Anyway. Um, so I, I do think that is something we can look at. And when those affidavits are written, and, and like, do, does that get a review? Does that get a review beyond just the supervisor? Like, if someone is going to be removed, like, does that come to your level to look at that affidavit? It does not come to my level. And okay. um, having just hit my four month mark, I would defer to my phone a friend. But um, I don't know, Brenda, if you want to address that. Certainly. Thank you. Um, so I'm, the, the Brenda facts Burley, of the, for the record. Thank you. Um, so the facts of the affidavit speak to the reasons why the child is in need of care and supervision. And so I think it is uh, valuable to be clear about what is the purpose of the affidavit. Mm -hmm. um, affidavits are written by family services workers and then reviewed by the family services supervisor. In many of our district offices, it's actually a leadership team review. That affidavit is then shared with the state's attorney or deputy state's attorney who then reviews that and um, submits the petition to the court. It is then brought before the judge who then um, decides whether or not to issue the temporary care order. Um, so there's three levels of review before there is an order to remove a child from a home. Thank you. And I hear Christine saying that this, this might be something to look at, and I hear you expressing some <coughs> interest and in my knowledge of um, the um, SRS slash uh, family services system is that there's 150 pages of rules and there's probably a format mm -hmm. or a template mm -hmm. and we could look at that, which is getting, I want to say, into the weeds, which may not really be our role. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we want to take a step back from that and rather hear, for instance, from the um, Child Welfare Training Partnership and we may not have time this summer to do that, but that put that on the list mm -hmm. in terms of that. Great. I think that's all I have for today. Do you have any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Christine and um, you. Um, thank you for beginning with setting the stage in terms of um, how these very hard and painful um, decisions around removing a child um, are not only for the families which we all know, but also for the people who are making, who are proposing that recommendation, and that that is something that everybody is going home with. Could I? Is it possible to get your testimony in writing? Yes, I am. Um, I'll, I'll get you a clean copy. Yeah, <laughs> and and I think in particular some of the procedures that 
Mary Beth was asking about. That's a good place to, to launch us off during okay. the session. Um, and I'm sorry, some of the people who I know in my other life would, I would be remiss if I did not comment that there is um, an ongoing discussion of, of counting and what is a case. And when they're, um, you know, if it's a case of, you know, mom and two kids, and that's a case. If it's a case of mom and step parents and grandparents and the neighbors next door and the three service providers, that, that um, that's a different level of work. Thank you. Um, there is a question out there as to where in our addressing the findings we are, and there has been a question as to whether or not those find the fact that we have not met them all, that we are now at a point where we might be fine, and so there might be a budgetary impact, and so that is why I have asked um, to ask Brenda to come. Did you hear that? for the Family Services Division, and um, it's my pleasure to share with you information about the federal review process within um, the Family Services Division. And you will get to the point of um, whether or not we're going to get fined, because I, that is what has been translated to us, that there's a possibility of a budgetary impact. So what we'll, we'll want to get to more quickly is what are the findings and where we are. Yes, I absolutely will cover the findings in detail with you. We do not have um, details regarding whether or how much we would be fined, but I'll, I'll explain that in greater detail toward the end. Fined by the feds? Or yes, oh. that's right. So the, no, the, the, no, I, that's okay. I just want to know who's fining us. The fe right, the federal government, the Children's Bureau specifically, and um, so um, all states have uh, what's called a Child and Family Services Review. That's the, the um, name that the federal government has given the review of states' child welfare systems, and that was put into effect in 1994. Vermont had the first federal review in 2000, another one in 2007, and then the most recent federal review occurred in 2015. Does the federal government contribute uh, resources for that review, for the review? Do we get any money from that? We don't get money. Um, we do have uh, federal participation in the review. So the federal review, uh, this most recent 2015 review, we used the um, online services review instrument. That's the tool that is used nationally at this point in time for those federal reviews. And that tool looks at seven outcome areas and measures a total of 18 different items. Um, so this, this first slide just gives you a snapshot of what some of those items are. And you'll see that it, it looks very specifically and not surprisingly at areas such as safety, permanency, well-being, um, you know, measures that are looking at that children are safe, um, that they're main maintained safely in their homes, um, that they have permanency, that they have family continuity, they have lifelong connections, um, efforts to ensure that children's needs are being met, um, that they have the appropriate services to meet their needs. Um, so that's just to give you a, a sense in general of the kinds of questions that are looked at for those reviews. And I wanted to let you know, Vermont is actually the first state in the nation to go through this most recent round of federal reviews. Um, so we did, we did volunteer to be the first state in the, in the nation to go, um, which is something that we're proud of. And um, it, it's um, a review where we chose a traditional review path, meaning that um, we used the federal instrument, instrument the, um, the review was done in partnership with 
folks from the Children's Bureau that came to Vermont and conducted that review side by side with Family <coughs> Services staff. We reviewed 65 cases uh, as was required and that was done in Burlington, St. Johnsbury, and Bennington. Um, Burlington was a requirement. Uh, states are always required to have their largest metropolitan area be a site for review. And um, as is uh, typical of all states, we fail. And that's, um, it, it's intentionally designed that way that uh, the bar is set very high. You have to pass 90% um, for each item to pass. And the intention behind that is really that you know, the purpose of the federal review is to help states to set goals and achieve those goals. Who um, picks the cases? Random. Okay. Yeah, completely random. And um, so we, um, we did pass two items in that first review. And, um, oh, I see that my mm -hmm. is not giving you. Services to protection. Yeah, let me just move it down a bit. Um, so the two two items that we did pass are um, that we have, have evidence of documentation in place that, that there are services to protect children, um, and we passed the item regarding placement with siblings. So after that, um, after that first federal review that, that occurred in 2015, then states are required to develop their program improvement plan. Um, and we, we developed our plan. The, the plan is required to lay out what the goals are, what the strategies are to achieve those goals, and the action steps. So we wrote our program improvement plan, submitted that, and it was approved in July of 2016. Um, and then we went about the business of carrying out that program improvement plan, which we have completed now. Um, so the, the program improvement plan itself, we had to select um, out, of the, out of the total items, nine items as our benchmark to pass. And these are the nine items that we chose. And so this, this slide here represents Vermont's program improvement plan. So can I just ask a question? Yes. Who are we? So, um, so so, so you know, like who, who was involved in um, writing, developing, and providing input to um, the PIP? So the, the PIP was written by Suzanne Shibley, who leads our performance. Uh, a name I don't know. Who, who are, I don't, don't care about. What are the constituencies? Whose voices, whose information did you Right, so the, the process basically is Children's Bureau comes to Vermont, sits down with Family Services Division leadership and states these are the areas that you can choose from. Here's the range of um, percentage to pass that you must put into your plan. Um, so then from there, Family Services Division leadership met, reviewed, this is where we pass, this is where we um, you know, think that we have opportunity to pass um, based on areas that we've been focusing on to, to grow our practice and wrote the plan from there. And then it's a lot of back and forth between okay. the federal government and leadership to okay. land on something that, that they would approve. They it's the between the federal program. government and the, and the state. Yes. This how cap this was identified. And, and then ultimately that. approved, correct. Yeah, and these nine items I will go into in more detail um, in just a couple slides to show you for each item whether we passed or not, how we passed, and um, and I'll tell you as well so that you know up front. Out of the nine items, we passed six. We did not pass three. So part of the program improvement plan is the states need to actually demonstrate to the Children's Bureau how we will improve our practice, and it, it is required that it is an ongoing review of cases by the states. In Vermont, we chose to, to have a review process that mirrored the process that the federal government 
required when they did the federal review, meaning that we continue to use the same review instrument and we used the same random sampling of 65 cases each year. Uh, we, we, were, we continued to be required to review Burlington each time as our metropolitan area. So since um, the fall of 2016, we conducted reviews every fall and spring in four district offices. Burlington was always one of them, the other three rotated through all of the remaining districts in the state. So, uh, I just want to understand the process a little bit. The PIP is created, and you've identified these, ar these areas that need improvement. What if anything happens within the agency um, folks uh, to educate um, the social workers or others um, that these are areas that need improvement. Do you, do you then have workshops or educational experiences, continuing ed of some type, so that we're reinforcing? I mean, you're not just, you know, just throwing it out there and then doing an evaluation. You have to be doing something inside. That's right. And right. what I would say is that the review process itself is its own greatest teacher. So workers are interviewed, supervisors are interviewed, all members of the case and team are interviewed as part of the process. The reviewers are division staff, quality assurance staff, and community stakeholders. And so the process itself requires that workers are preparing their cases to be reviewed. The instrument is applied to the case. The instrument itself has detailed feedback about areas of need and areas of strength that are then shared back with the worker. And then we have ongoing meetings with our supervisors, our directors, and our division leadership team each quarter. Here's our outcomes. Here's where we're strong. Here's where we need to continue to improve. Um, so it's actually, it's a pretty robust process in terms of continuous feedback loop, really utilizing the interviews and the review results ongoing to, to inform practice. So with that in mind, then what what where does the where does the review end? Then ha then if you're doing all of this, and the process itself is uh, relates to improvement, how do you so how do you know it's a permanent improvement or it's not just related to those specific cases? So the the bar is high. So we have to actually demonstrate strength in a pretty high percentage, which often takes repeated reviews of cases. Mm -hmm. So um, we didn't pass all six right. items after one quarter of reviews. It was you know four or five, six quarters of reviews and continuous feedback to get to passing. So it's, it, takes, it takes quite a lot to get there. So that's the eight, there's an eight year period that, or, or we can, no, or so I, said, I see three years here. That's right, okay. three year period. And if part of what I heard in her question, maybe it's because I wanted to hear that in her question, um, uh, this is happening. Um, are there any, you, the department got feedback in any of your 150 pages of rules and guidance, do you make any changes? Um, are there um, new or different trainings that are offered to, um, I think that's part of what you were, that's, and that's a yes or no. Yes, and and um, so, and I can go through the six areas to give you a sense of what was looked at, if, if you would like, um, that's, um, I have six slides, one for each item, mm -hmm. and then at the end is a, a summary of some of the broader areas of change that we've implemented as part of the program improvement, so if that detail and, might and, and what's not on the slide, which we will want to know about, is what are the potential part of the process is that when you don't pass the three after the program plan, there is a possibility, that's my understanding, so, but there is a possibility of a federal fine. Yes. And so we need to know what that is, what that possibility is. And um, I realize that you may be in negotiation or things like that, or we're first out of the gate, but um, 
Right. This is all new to us, new information to us as a legislative branch. <coughs> so it and it's it's new to the nation. And so I think um, you know the, the bottom line there is the federal government has not yet provided us with any detail regarding whether we will be fined or how much. Um, but I imagine there's something in the process that says you could be fined up to a certain amount. There is something in the process that says you could be fined. There is not specificity regarding the amount. So the first area is the timeliness of initiating investigations and reports of maltreatment. And um, this is an area that we passed. And this is really about documenting that if we're conducting a child safety intervention, that it, that it occurred timely, or if for whatever reason it couldn't deter occur timely, that we properly Just documented why. Just I understand what this means. 86.9 passed. Of the 65 cases that they looked at? Correct. And that means that 13.1 did not pass? Um, Yes. What, okay. it, what it, yes. And what it means is that right, for that item, right, here. Yeah. right, right, that we had to have documentation that All the 65, that. 13 did 13 percent didn't pass, 86 did. Right, if right. If I would gotten that in college, I'd have done it a lot sooner. And you had appropriations. And then did a great job. the second area um, is an area that we did not pass, which is risk and safety assessment and management. Um, and so this one really looked at, um, yeah, so this is an area that was looking at the initial risk and safety assessments. Um, you know, were they completed and documented in the file? Uh, was there documentation of ongoing assessment and safety of safety and risk in the home? Um, was there uh, safety and risk assessment documentation in case notes? Um, and then are there safety, uh, safety incidents and concerns um, that indicate they were addressed in a safety plan with the family as appropriate and being monitored throughout the case? Um, so that's a, lot, that is the, that's a lot that's pretty broad. I will tell you what this one really boiled down to for us is that in our ongoing practice in our case notes, were our case notes specific in reflecting the ongoing assessment of safety and risk that that worker was doing during those ongoing home visits? Um, so it's it's a quality assurance issue with regard to appropriate documentation. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to make an editorial comment that really? many times you know, that does not reflect that we didn't try to protect the child. It reflects right. that somebody didn't write the night write notes and this is right. stupid if you ask me. I mean this is this is to you know did a well I mean I understand why you're doing it, but it, it, it just, is. just you know it's just it, like this is this is documentation. This yeah, is it's, this it's, is um, it's become that way and bureaucratic out, right away. These these people that are doing this ought to go out there and work with some of those kids mm -hmm. and, and families. Yeah. And on some level. And see how, you know, see how well they do in keeping track of what they just saw when they got out of there to write their case notes. Mm -hmm. And the, I'm, I'm just frustrated that it's easy to stand here and criticize, but it's very difficult to do that job. And these kids are much tougher today than they ever were. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. The kids that I worked with were much easier than they are today. I don't right. think I could they do it. They just need today. a little luck. No. So, I mean, you know, this, I. I appreciate that we're trying to do this, but I think we need to recognize, and the federal government needs to recognize. Oh, don't get me going. Okay. Well, thank you. I just want to recognize for the these are case notes. It doesn't necessarily mean we're not. I don't want anybody who sees this on whatever you're televising for uh, and think that our risk is, it means that we're not um, doing risk and safety assessments and management with kids, right. it means that somebody didn't write the notes down correctly. Right, and that area was in much most more cases. in the ongoing, not in the front In end. most cases. Yeah, right. And, right. And, the, and, the yeah, and the challenge is, Good point. is, it is back to the things that Christine mentioned in terms of what were some of the um, um, challenges in the system overall, 
well, which is trying to number, of cases, or number, number of cases and things like that. And yes. at the same time, without documentation. So um, there's when the, I leave and someone else takes it up, or when there is a record sharing, yeah. if we, it's, but this, you're right, it's totally right. This doesn't necessarily reflect, it is a proxy that the federal government has set. Right. Um, so the next area but is we pass um, this one. placement changes we pass. So this that is placement stability. Mean, it just means the case notes were correct. <laughs> no, the next one's, the next one's better. Oh. Yes, so looking at um, Moving on. permanency, placement, stability, um, we, we did pass this item, um, which is a very important item. Um, and then next we looked at, uh, under permanency goal, um, this one looks at, in terms of, um, this one we did not pass, 53%. Um, so this is looking at, um, initial case plans are completed within 60 days, um, and then permanency and concurrent goals. This one we primarily did not pass because we did not have the initial case plans completed within 60 days. Um, we, we, um, we know we have a quality assurance work to do in terms of more timely completion of, of the initial case plan, which so again relates to workload. Is it possible to do it within 60 days given the, what, what I feel is the, Caseload? The caseload. No. It's yes. I I would I would say that caseload challenges yeah. definitely play into this. Particular Is the sixty item. days a federal requirement? Yeah. Yes. There's there's federal language there, and then we also have um, state language and state statute language and policy language. And some of it is you know wanting to make sure that the family knows as soon right. as possible. Specific. Right. What what are the you know areas that have been identified to address. And what I meant is this also then connects to some of what our first two in you know, a different topic people were talking about in terms of delays when a good portion of, such, of um, family service workers need to spend time in court. And when they're, they're waiting or things like that, then if they're there, like they can't be somewhere they else. They can't be necessarily so somewhere else. We need a better public defender system for more people. And it's also in our non-court involved cases, so our family support cases, um, which is an area, again, that, um, you know, it, it's a valuable quality assurance area mm -hmm. to shine a light. How can we ensure that we have more timely case plans for families? And um, so we are certainly working actively on that. Um, I do that. Why is it we say that 41.4% passed? Over here we say 53% did not pass. Because the did not pass are the three ones that. Well, I know. But why is that? Why is it? Rep I mean. And that, well, because on the did not pass, only 43% passed, and um, this one, 47 passed. Uh, and so, it's a different benchmark. Each each okay, I, indicator. Okay, I won't get into that. It just gets confusing when I read it. Um, we're saying forty-one percent passed. That means sixty percent roughly didn't, right? Yes. Over here, we're saying fifty-three percent didn't pass. That means forty something didn't. I, right. Know. So it's a different benchmark. Okay. So the federal government I'll, sets a different benchmark for each I, item. Probably some congressman sat there and figured this out. <laughs> It, it has to do with what our base. I can tell is. you're not going to run for Congress. No. Okay. I think this is Welsh did this. So I, I, I probably should have explained more clearly from yeah. the beginning. When, when we job. did the um, okay. 65 cases reviewed with the so federal government. I got it, but it just doesn't, you know, it's like, what are they hiding? <laughs> uh, they, they, they set benchmarks that, um, in theory, were achievable. So what would it take for us to have incremental improvement to achieve this, the standard, the new standard? Um, so this next item we passed, this is um, achieving reunification or um, permanency, and this one looked at our concurrent planning efforts and um, basically that we're achieving permanency through reunification within 12 months or through adoption within 24 months. Which, I'm sorry, is a totally ridiculous time span for so much of what I really mean, if you are talking about a family who is engaged in some serious hard work, a year 
might not be enough time. That does not necessarily mean that the child could not be returned safely and thrive, and the family thrive, just because they haven't, whatever, right. addressed, mm -hmm. fixed all of their the issues that have gotten in the way. Right, and I mean, I think the Federal Adoption Safe Families Act gives us um, the opportunity to say that, you know, the reunification needs to occur timely, um, children need to return home, or the goal needs to change to adoption with if, um, if that child is not returned in 15 of the past 22 months, the child, the goal needs to change to adoption, unless there are compelling reasons why not. And I would say, that I, would, I would offer good, bad, or indifferent, that some of those compelling reasons is that the community service providers who were doing some of the work that, to assist families um, have either have waiting lists or aren't always able to um, meet the demand that, that they have. Yes, and the, the goal is not 100% in this item yeah. for that reason. Uh, so there is, I think, um, allowance for a range, but then there's also a measure so that we are paying attention to timely permanence and what the barriers to that are. And then the well-being item. Um, so this one we passed, and this is looking at um, that we have the documentation of the initial and ongoing assessment um, to ensure that appropriate services are in place. Mm -hmm. um, and so this one, I think, to some degree speaks to your point, is really okay. making sure that we're looking at are we providing appropriate services to families so that that um, timely permanency can occur. And then the next one we passed, um, the case planning, that we have documentation um, that the child and family were involved in the case planning, um, that the evidence uh, supports that they understand the case plan and what's required, um, and that the information um, through the interview process of the review uh, was considered um, in, in terms of whether that child and family were involved in, in developing the plan and in that process. Um, so this is an item that, that we did pass. Congratulations. <laughs> yes, thank you. That one took a little longer. Um, and then caseworker visits with the child that we passed. Um, and this is that visitation, uh, that monthly face-to-face -face contact with the child, um, and that there was evidence of documentation that the family services worker had private um, audience with the child to discuss the goals um, and assess the services and supports that are needed. Um, we did pass that item. And then caseworker visits with parents. That's our third one that we didn't pass. Yes, there it goes. Um, did not pass, and this is um, parent-child contact occurring regularly, including engagement with non-custodial parent, um, making ongoing and concerted efforts to identify, locate, and engage the non-custodial parent. Um, and that is an area um, that uh, we certainly are, are continuing to shine a light on um, for quality assurance purposes. Mm -hmm. um, and then this just, is just a question mm -hmm. going back to the benchmarks. If we were to look at what the benchmarks were, were uh, or are for each one of these, um, that we'd have an idea of how well we have passed. So, right. So, I mean, so, do we have that information? Yes. Yes, I can certainly provide more detail. What that yeah. would give you is, after the original federal review, here's here was the percentage for each area, and then here's the benchmark that we set for improvement. And we also have for all 18 areas. Okay. So is that something that's on your web page? The full report, uh, I believe it is. Okay. Um, and, that's good. Yeah. There's, and there's uh, full detail in terms of percentage in each area. Just, just a question on item 15, caseworker visits with parents. Can you, can you speak to, just very briefly, the underlying reason why we didn't pass that? Yes, so there's, there's the household from which the child was removed, um, often referred to as the custodial parent, 
and then there's the household, um, if there's a non-custodial parent um, that we also need to have monthly face-to-face -face contact with. And um, we may not have identified that individual, that individual may not live in Vermont. Um, and so efforts to identify and engage the non-custodial parent is a, a challenging area. And so really wanting to um, continue to, to grow our practice in that area. Thank you. Yeah. That speaks to, I think, what um, Christine said about mm -hmm. she father thought she was father engagement. Yes, right. mm -hmm. father engagement, mm -hmm. absolutely. And, and the fatherhood engagement, not only the non-custodial parent, but, but the entire paternal extended family that could be a resource to the child um, is, is a vital area that we want to continue to grow to our family finding efforts. So this, this speaks to your earlier question. This is an area of kind of a summary of um, actions that we have completed as part of our program improvement plan um, that was submitted and accepted by our federal partners. And so this looks at, you know, we have implemented a pre-caseload training requirement for all new hires. So family services workers do not receive a caseload now until they've completed foundations, and that includes classroom, online, and shadowing. Um, we've implemented our structured decision-making tools. We did a, a substantial um, effort to train and retrain and revise all of our structured decision-making tools, which are all the validated tools that um, help to drive consistency and, and quality in decision-making in the practice. We have implemented substance use um, screening capacity in all 12 districts now, um, so we have uh, Lund substance use case managers that go out with our front end workers. Screening who? So, so these are Lund substance use case managers that are screening parents where there is um, a known or suspected substance use issue. They actually go out with that worker that first knock on the door. They are there to um, answer any questions about substance use and they, they provide a bridge from the screen to Lund the assessment. Is going to Yes, we now have them in all 12 of our district offices, so all um, front-end interventions, if there's um, a concern that substance use could be an issue, they're right there side-by-side side with the worker. Okay. And they've actually achieved 80% success in engaging that parent in treatment. Wow. Is the screen yes, a chemical? I mean, is it like your analysis, or is it screening? No, nope, it's the uncope. Um, so it's five questions, and if if um, two out of the five questions is a yes, then they then they get referred on to an assessment, and then if the assessment ind indicates treatment, then that lens substance use case manager is facilitating engagement in treatment, which could be helping with transportation, answering questions. Um, so it's been, been a very successful model. Uh, we've had a. I'm, sorry, I'm just curious as to what screening. Yep, okay. yep, you. substance use screening. Uh, continued focus on um, our staff safety policy and the role of our staff safety manager. Um, we've implemented a new policy for our conditional custody cases. Um, we've had a substantial expansion of the Beckett Support and Stabilization Program, which what is, program um, is that? so that is wraparound supports. It's a 90-day bridge. So any youth that is in a high-end placement, so residential level treatment, it's a, a bridge to help those youth to return to the community. Um, and it's a, it's a program that we, I would say, have had um, incredible include, success there as well. That, that includes kids in residential care at Beckett? It, it, yes, it, yep, it targets it's kind all. Of, uh, I think that's odd. So Beckett is helping you to get kids out of their program? And all of our programs. So, they, so, the, so we, we. That's a conflict of interest, if, if, okay. in my view. I would, I would, I flag that as a conflict. Beckett, you contract with Beckett to place kids, right? Um, we we place kids in in a Beckett facility, but but we control whether and they. And then go we in hire Beckett they... to help get kids out of. Um, when we're when we're stepping them down from residential care, they provide a wrap back in the community. Um, and so, and it's for all of the residential programs. I, not I find that to be a conflict, personally. So I'm just calling that uh, mm -hmm. uh, as I see it. I think that we in government need to be careful about who we're um, 
you know, the same people that are providing the residential treatment are providing the support in the community. That's just something. So, but, but let me ask this question about that. The, when the child is placed in the Beckett home, there is a plan for that child, and the plan includes moving back to the community. Is there a time frame for that included? Always. So, always. so it's, it's, not necessarily, it's not necessarily a conflict that they want to keep but, the but kid. My opinion. Yeah, no, no, you can. I, I'm, 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 I just and, and, want to understand it. Thank you. And, and, and in the two minutes that, um, <laughs> that Brenda has left, and she's done a fabulous job of being given less time um, than she was originally mm -hmm. given. Um, can we have our committee discussion? Yes. The difference is, and sure. let her go through her yeah. presentation. All right, thank you. And I'm happy to have a offline yeah. conversation about that at any point. Um, and so, so just finishing the list, we have our qualitative case review process. Um, we've Im implemented our structured decision-making reunification assessment tool. Uh, we've revised our case plan. We've um, put in place a consistent statewide process for assessing potential foster homes. Um, we've implemented our statewide foster home recruitment and retention plan. So that's, that's our diligent recruitment plan. I don't know if you've heard of that, but that's, uh, that was a required part of our PIP. And that just began, correct? Well, so we, it, for the past year and a half, we've been developing our diligent recruitment plan, and we, are, we have been piloting it in three districts, and we're now rolling, rolling it out across the whole state. And we could certainly provide um, that plan to the committee as well, if you would like. Um, and then we've implemented a method for, um, for tracking our training records. That's another area that we had not passed. Um, so that's in place now as well. Um, so the PIP ended September 30th. Um, as I mentioned before, we were the first state in the nation to complete our program improvement plan. And um, the, the Children's Bureau will issue a letter soon regarding their final determination on our achievement of goals. Now, is that a letter that then we negotiate and send back, or is this? Uh, my understanding is that they will determine um, a certain percentage and um, issue their determination. I, I don't believe it's a negotiation. Okay, so, so this is when we're going to find out if we're going to be fined. If, if there's any Correct. financial It'll be in that um, That's right. um, repercussions for not meeting all, um, all of these. That's right. Now, um, are PIPs in general a new thing? So no. in the past, if it, in the past, if a state, after their program improvement plan, and I'm not saying Vermont, but in terms of what you know, in the past, have states been fined? I, and I, I my, my experience is that there has been discussion of being fined. I'm not aware of states being fined, um, but I, I, I know that currently, when we have met with Children's Bureau, they have stated to us in this most recent round that states would be penalized if they did not pass. Okay, and in those discussions, when which were informal and not, what is the range? Or did they just generally say you could be fined? Or did they say you could be fined from $10 to a quarter of a million dollars? Um, so they, they have said that it would be a percentage, and they don't know what the percentage will be yet. Um, but I was a part of a meeting at one point. There was an uh, anecdotal, for example, kind of a statement that was along the lines of as much as $200,000 per um, item that we don't pass. Okay. So it's a, it, it might be a percentage, might even be a quarter of a percentage or right. one or two percent. Right. Of what of the of the federal money that we um, that the feds give us for my understanding is it's just a fine oh, per fine. item it's okay. a fine per item yeah yeah and they they have not yet told us what the amount would be 
um, they've speculated with us what the So, and happened. we could take that fine and, and invest it into it, make improvements in our system. No, 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 no. I'm kidding. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, 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 I guess I'm going to ask a oh, question. Sorry, yeah. um, I'm going to jump over your head. I'm going to ask, a, make a request of the commissioner um, that when you get that letter, do you think you could share? Is, are you, um, do you have permission to share that letter with the legislature? So Ken Jess, Commissioner of the Department for Children and Families, for the record, I'm very comfortable telling you that when we get the letter, we will share it with you. All right. Thank you. In terms of timing, of, of both timing and place of, place of the meetings for the next um, two meetings, for, um, for the two November, yeah, what, what about the October meeting? Yeah, that, that's the first one. October, what's the date on that? 31st. October 31st? Yeah, October 31st. We're going to have to do, um, because the state house is shutting down. So we're going to have, and I'll send an email out to everybody about this, but. Um, but we were going to all be in costume. And the fourth <laughs> floor of the, of the tax building. The te which floor? The fourth floor. The fourth floor. Um, okay, so the. Um, um, we have, um, my understanding is after this meeting, we have two more meetings. Do we have three more meetings? I have that we are meeting October 31st yep. and November 21st. Yes, that's what I have. So we only have, we have two more meetings. We're, um, and, um, yep. Uh, the suggestion, uh, um, a suggestion slash request has been made that um, rather than meet 10 to 2 or 3, that we meet um, 12 to 4. This is um, on Halloween and on November 21st? Yes. And this is, this is a request made from um, a couple of the individuals who um, either travel far or have um, other um, employment that perhaps makes it hard. Okay, and um, and Kelly has been was um, polled for the first one, and that helps her as well. So, um, and I live in a condo, so kids don't come to the <laughs> for Halloween. I am always. Um, I think maybe my husband will answer the door. Okay, so, um, so the, um, our, our final two meetings will be in the fourth floor of the tax building, and they will be from 12 to 4, so please... Um, I'll send an email out. Um, please send an email out, um, and uh, I'm going to assume that one can, we can bring our sandwiches to the tax building or at least earlier. Yeah. Um, kind of stuff. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so that is that. Um, uh, okay. Um, NCSL has sent me a because um, I'm on some committee. I don't know what it is, but um, sent me information. They're having a webinar um, on the financial aspects of the um, NCSL Family First stuff. And um, so I was just going to send that out to our, I mean, uh, if people are able to do that or not, um, but just to let folks know. I have that, it somewhere, but send okay. it. Okay, right, okay, yeah. I, I, so I will, when I find it, I will send it. That was this morning, I got it, or yesterday, and um, uh, yeah. Good afternoon. Yes. Um, that it, the um, it's November thirteenth at one p.m. Eastern on fiscal issues related to family first prevention services, and especially given the, the um, comment, suggestion, proposal um, from Larry that. A use of some of this money is for this, whether it is or isn't, we can just get back there. Um, I can also send you information yeah, I, specific to that. Um, but so, um, um, 
And Ken, I don't know if you, if your office needs it, wants it, or whatever. NCSL is having a um, <clears throat> webinar on fiscal issues related to Family First Prevention Services Act. Do you know when that is? Yes, November thirteenth. I, okay. I, 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 I will forward this. Oh, thank you. I asked. I, I sort of said, "Can I forward this to staff and legislators?" And so they said yes. But I just wanted folks to sort of know. Um, oh, yes know that um, and Senator Sears isn't here but I want to get back to it our, our first meeting um, various people were, were um, he or was interested in something we to wait um, and writing a letter to our con congressional delegation around um, this federal legislation and how it really doesn't quite some of the requirements um, don't quite work for small rural states mm -hmm. and I don't know if we feel like that's something that we have got enough information that we're okay that we want to do something or whatever but I don't know if you have any thoughts um, it, that I, 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 I actually think that it might be a good idea if we did okay and um, I think um, can you help us sure. okay um, so Ken, yes. um, would you work with Bryn, who's not here right now, in um, writing a letter from, not from you, this is the, this is the ghost writing, um, no, I mean, um, in terms of um, some of, you know, um, some of their concerns, so, some of their concerns and, or, you know, challenges. And then, right. um, and then, right. and then Brent can give it to us ahead of time, and we can change it and change it. Okay. I'm glad you didn't touch it. Let me get that going. Okay. And poor Brent doesn't know this is coming. I, I gathered that. Um, oh, let's see. That's that's um, that. Um, you want to maybe? Um, some of you went to Woodside. Again. Mm -hmm. Yes. As we did, and I didn't know if there was anything around that that you thought we needed to know or whatever. Um, I think there's a lot going on right now in looking at the facilities and the programming needed. It might be useful um, to have an update from Commissioner Schatz. Don't worry, not today. But, Right, right now, in depth. Um, no, but an update on Woodside, where it is, and what what planning and um, what what's going on. I think we did just that. Um, we had a really terrific time going through and meeting the staff, talking with the staff, learning about their programs, and and then having lunch. But the the kids actually took us through the facility. Mm -hmm and then shared with us uh, what they're doing and their next steps. Mm -hmm. And then some of the tensions that exist between decision making, between parents and kids when next steps are um, being designed. So that was all, it was all very useful to me. Uh, but it also gave us kind of a, a sense of um, the, the things that we can do, the things that we can't do, and maybe um, what, we, what, we, what we should do. So you know, maybe we could get a little, if we get an update. Sure, I'll awesome. provide an update just to refresh your memory. We have a report due January 15th. Yep. And so I can give you a status update in terms of where we are um, on, a, on a range of issues. You know, and I think that one of the things that would be helpful is to really uh, give us some case studies what's going on with some of the kids where are the real problem areas and uh, where are that what are the areas that we can provide what services can we provide and what we can't provide what else so I, we heard from um, first of all as Jenny said we we took the tour and the, um, the young people led the tour it was really great Skyler came with us and he was the absolute uh, 
Cats Meow. They the boys mm -hmm. loved him. Oh, he, he knew all the Chicago music. He knew all the yeah. music, and he <laughs> played pickleball with them in the gym, which for, for a good forty five minutes. Um, the, we heard from parents who have a child there. Um, I don't know, the piece I was left with was this very difficult decision of, um, of DCF wanting to get the child into a program that we don't have in the state that is, is far away, and the parents um, wanting him because of attachment issues to be local. So it really, it was, a, it was kind of a microcosm issue of all of the voices and factors at play and how you weigh those. Um, I was of the understanding that when the clinical director left, they were no longer, you know, kind of continuing with this therapeutic environment, but that is not the case. It's they're fully still operating that and running it. Um, so that was good to see. Um, and I would say lastly, the kids, um, you know, kind of leaned over and said to us, yeah, our portions are twice as big for this lunch because you're here. <laughs> so, yeah, they got, got a double helping. Yeah, we got a double, they got a double helping. They were very excited about that. So it was, it was a lovely day. We were there for almost four hours. Okay. So it was, it was a great, great experience. So, so you would like, so, um, I think Woodside, a little update on, on, on Woodside in terms of the planning and where we are on that. Yeah. And based on what we had um, talked about and heard and questions we had last meeting is to um, at, uh, get some more, um, some more information perhaps from outside the state or whatever in terms of what does different models yeah. Of, of, of ombudsman advocate kind of thing. Yeah. And so that would be next. Can, can I, so we, we're, we're focused so much on um, intervention and treatment, you know, and especially um, now we've been talking about families in disarray, which is really. Mm -hmm. um, could we bring in some folks who are working on? Uh, prevention programs like the after-school program um, that ha that has been demonstrated to be so effective. I mean, maybe just talking a little bit about Iceland um, as a, as the model that has served as a comprehensive model for prevention and in the and changing the culture. Uh, they don't have to talk about every, the, what they're doing right now. I think that's more appropriate for our committees, but I think just globally what's going on with that, what that model looks like. Um, I don't think everybody has heard about it. You don't? No, have you heard about Iceland? Say? I heard that I, I heard that there is some new information around uh -huh. funding and where they're laying they're trying this yeah. in a few communities in Vermont that um, after school got some significant funding. That's right. There. So I, I yeah, it'd be interesting to know what it, it's just to tee us up for what's well, coming in the session. Well, what I might suggest is putting if we have if that's what we're going to do is perhaps start um, also. Um, <coughs> If we're talking about prevention, and maybe that maybe that doesn't fit in here, but we did we did create a um, a position. Yeah, no kidding. Um, um, that, this that, the administrative chief. There was supposed to be an administrative yeah. chief. I'm not quite sure if anyone's been hired or where we are. Father Watersaw, if that's what you're referring to, has been hired to be receiving the services. To be up, um, not she the person who's in the health department. Who's in this? I can't remember. Mm -hmm. I thought she was in the secretary's office, but I don't know. Yes, the secretary's office. That's the one we're looking for. So that has that hire yes. taken place? Yes, all the water. So again, if I'm making a mistake, I apologize. Oh, no, she's, she's, yeah, no, she's, she's the trauma. trauma. Yes. Yeah. She's the trauma person. Oh, okay. I thought that was the same. So yeah, no, no, no. Sorry. All right. <laughs> all right. So I apologize, but if you, when, if you, Talking about prevention at our last meeting, you had expressed some interest in hearing more potentially from Brina Holmes about the sustained home visiting mm -hmm. proposal. Mm -hmm. And I just want to ask if you want yeah. to have a presentation 
I'm certainly glad to help facilitate that if you decide that's what is of interest to you. Um, if people wanted to get, I think what we can do is, um, and this will be challenging, but whether it's Brina, whether, I mean, Brina and the um, Iceland or other kinds yeah. of things, and then um, people were here last week, or the last time is now is escaping me, doing something um, with, I think from Dartmouth, but in the White River Junction area. What? Okay, with Easter seals, and so they might. So what I what I might say is that we could um, offer those three people about an hour. Sounds very good. You know, yeah. um, helps us. Good. I missed the Woodside discussion, evidently, but that's fine. Um, it, but it, it, what was, it, is that on a future agenda yeah. or? Mm -hmm. um, if people people went to Woodside. Yeah, no, I know. Did you go? Not this it, time, it, but it, I went it, in the spring. Um, and and what grew out of that was a, um, a a suggestion that we have an update on where things are okay. in the future plane. Does that make sense? Yep. And I wanted to know: Did anybody bring up he hearing from Judge Grierson, uh, Marshall Paul, mm -hmm. um, James Pepper about the concerns expressed by Larry and his and Bill Young? Um, we haven't done that, but we can add that to the no, I mean, next week. Right. So, so that I would like to know their response, as well as obviously Ken, or somebody from DCF, what is the response to their report and their recommendations? Um, okay, so, so response from, from you too. Okay. Well, three of them, three of the four are right here. The other would be the state's attorneys. Um, okay. Okay. Well, um, might I suggest that um, Mr. Christ has had his, his opportunity to share his concerns, I believe. No, I wasn't asking him to speak. Oh, okay. I, was, I was just pointing out that you were writing down who, and yes. I said that three of them are here, and the other one is James Power, the state's attorneys. Okay, so James. I think that's it, right? You speak on behalf of the GALs as well as the judges. Yes. Okay. I wasn't. I wasn't trying to get them to talk. Just, I'm giving you grief. I know. Um, you um, like doing that. It's very fun. You've been doing it for 20 years. <laughs> and we're getting younger and younger. Are we? Yes. Um, uh, we do have an, a, something that we have to do. I, I, in the sense that we were the committee of jurisdiction. There's some kind of reach up report. Then I forget. It was like. We, we have actually put it on the agenda for today, and um, I, I was informed that the report's not due until the 31st. We do an annual report. We do an annual report. Um, would you be ready on the 31st? I mean, we have, we have two meetings left, the 31st and then one in November. Um, which of those two meetings will you be ready to come? And I'll, uh, I'll adjust to your schedule. I'll talk to my staff in terms of if you want us to be ready for the 31st. I expect we could do that. Um, that might be helpful because further on then we lose, the, the, at the last meeting we lose Senator Shears. And so if there is anything that um, reflects actions or comments that this committee wants to make, even though I guess we don't make reports anymore, right? We, we could talk about, you know, oh, but we're losing Dick. Um, we should talk briefly about whether there are any legislative recommendations right. we as a committee want to make. Mm -hmm. So, so you, so um, I want to say next month's the ne our next meeting is full. I'm going to say that right now, based on if we're going to do mm -hmm. um, wood site planning. Yep. Child advocate, um, the reach up, um, that would be five things. It, um, Do you have prevention down there? Right, right. Yeah. Woodside, child advocate, reach up, prevention, response, and then talk. Something probably. Um, okay. Um, you can. You, um, you 
can do reach up the last um, the last meeting. That would be great. Um, because that's I mean reach up is important, but it is not as um, related to the things that we are doing right here in terms of legislation. Do and you want an update at that time on SNAP as a SNAP for sure. children? Yeah. Which is huge. Can you find out what else the feds are doing? Sorry. Yeah. I have one other right. Okay, good. Um, Representative Kelly. Mm -hmm. I can't pronounce her last oh, well, name. I, 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 you know. Yep, okay. She's not here, but yep. she and I are trying to meet with some people at the 31st meeting, but we're unsure of what time we're meeting. Oh, um, we're meeting 12 to 4. Okay, that's what we wanted to know. That's yeah. all we care about. Okay, we're meeting 12 to 4 at the next Good. two We're meetings. meeting from 11 to 1 then with these other people. <laughs> no, it's, it's just was, we were trying to yeah. set up a meeting regarding the opiate response and then, Okay, cool. People from ADAP. Perfect. So she and I decided on that. We weren't sure we would be meeting at 3 or 11. Yeah, no, there's, there was, I mean, basically. Senator Westman won out again? No, actually, represented by did. Oh. Because she, um, she has to come a longer distance than Senator Westman, who has good ideas and he has other people. Then. <laughs> <laughs> I never would do that. <laughs> okay. So we're going to have Brenda do the 60 page report? Uh, yes, yeah. Brenda do the 60 page report. Okay. Um, Bryn, while you were out, you do never want to um, We have um, the, um, the commissioner of DCF has offered to um, he volunteered. Provide he was voluntold. He Vol volunteered. Um, he volunteered. He volunteered. <laughs> To, um, if you recall, in one of our first meetings, um, and actually Senator Sears brought this up, some, and we were, like, we, we were sort of concurring, but wanting more information around um, how um, love the idea of the families um, first prevention, but um, and love the goals. Some of the things that are out there um, for small rural states don't seem to fit, like we don't have big institutions, and we, how many of our foster homes actually have six kids, those are our group homes, don't be an exaggeration. And so um, we decided that we did want to write a letter to our congressional delegation, okay. and he volunteered to, um, to help in writing that letter <coughs> and um, providing to work with you in writing a letter from us that if you could then um, yeah. buy. If, if, um, actually, by the 31st, so that, because this is something that Senator Sears um, spearheaded, so that we could um, discuss it and make, a, make as much of a final decision about it on that meeting. That would be great. Sure thing. Thank you. That's in lieu of the 30-page report. It'll just be a 30-page letter. <laughs> um, so, okay, and then, so letter, and so, um, and we actually have an agenda, and I'll get it for, for the next week. Okay. And we're going to be, we changed the meeting times for the, our last two meetings from 12 to, 12 to 4. Okay. And they're but all going to be in fourth floor of the tax building because of, State House things. Um, okay, thank you. Um, moving right along, because I know that we are going to lose um, Senator Westman at um, two. two. So, um, thank you. Uh, for the record, Brian Pearson, Chief Superior Judge. Um, Katie is providing you a handout that the committee may have received for the last time. These are the fiscal year. Uh, this will be your ending July, uh, June 30th this year, numbers for all of the um, juvenile related dockets. I've also attached uh, a single page that was supposed to show all of the guardians uh, that have been appointed, but as I looked at the exhibit that you have, uh, apparently when I uh, printed this, I left off uh, 
two columns, meaning the total column. So um, I, can, I, I will send a, a, a new document for you electronically that will tell you all of the, the categories that are missing. Yours ends in delinquency, there's then youthful offender, variant, and then there's a total for each county. So um, certainly as it relates to uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think a couple of them. So it's something different. So correct ones. These these do have the totals. That's all I have right here. You want to share that with you? So I'm not knowing exactly what the committee uh, is looking for. Let me just give you, uh, I guess, a big picture um, yeah. of, the, of the guardian, guardian ad litem um, situation. What you have in front of you represents all of the guardians. Not complete. No, it's not complete. The one we have is not complete. No. So that, that is why, that, that is why he's asking why. you to make a copy. Oh, okay. Got it. No problem. I apologize. No, no. So the, the chart in front of you uh, that some of you have and all of you will have in a minute represents all of the guardians appointed in the various juvenile dockets. Those are the guardians um, that I believe, I don't know, the last, two sessions ago I believe was included in budget for additional uh, staff and training of guardians. And we're, involved in that process now to expand uh, the training and development of guardians. Um, and Rob can fill you in on the details of where that stands. But we certainly have made some significant progress with the funds that the legislature allocated to increase our staffing in, in these dockets. Um, these dockets, the individuals are recruited and train specifically for these dockets. Uh, they, and we follow uh, the CASA national standards um, in our training and in our practice. And that, not to get too far into the weeds of um, the legislation, but that's why one of our proposals last year was to change the name of the individuals working in these dockets in front of you to CASA as opposed to guardian ad litem, and I'll explain the difference, but you should be aware that these folks are trained according to those standards, and always have been. This is nothing new, it's just a, basically a change in the name is what we're proposing. I'm distinguishing these dockets and these guardians from guardian ad litems that we use in the domestic docket and the probate court. We have seen a significant increase in the demand in probate court over the last four or five years uh, that coincides with the increase uh, impact of the opiate epidemic impacting obvious, uh, clearly all of our dockets one way or another. But probate court has seen it because a lot of individuals uh, find themselves, uh, folks my age and circumstances with grandchildren, that are going into probate court usually to begin with, with voluntary guardianships of their grandchildren because the parents are impacted by the opiate epidemic. Those proceedings generally are, are uncontested. Where they become problematic is a few years later when the parent feels they've recovered to the point they want their children back and their grandparents resist. And so that's where the contested hearings come into play. And that's where we've seen an increased need for guardian ad litems in those proceedings. Um, we don't have any guardians specifically trained for that docket. And because of the need for them in this docket, and because of the training we receive, we restrict uh, the other courts, probate court, and the domestic docket, um, uh, divorce, from using these guardians because they are not trained in those other guardians, <coughs> number one. And number two, these folks are trained specifically for the issues that are in the, uh, primarily in the Chins docket, but they're used in the other juvenile dockets. So, so help me. Um, yeah. So, <clears throat> CASA and 
CASA standards or CASAs they do is, or the training they receive, is significantly different than what perhaps in other states or whatever a GAL is in domestic and other things. Because you're saying you want a, a name change. Yes. To reflect the different roles and responsibilities. You then, and maybe I've lost something here, you then went on to talk about probing. And you said probate courses, uh, cases were increasing. And one of the exemplars that you were using was opiate, or shall I say, more people who, rather than involving the state, mm -hmm. have um, involved their families. And so would the CASA people then be assigned to those cases in probate? Generally speaking, no. Even though the issues may be very much the same and where the there may be concerns that um, uh, the placement of my giving my child to my aunt, uncle, grandmother was, um, it wasn't, let's say, maybe I wasn't totally on board with that, but the alternative, I felt like I had no alternative. And so, um, so the, the difference is when I say generally no, it's because of the demand in these documents for the guardian ad litem. Folks, we don't want to change the name to it. It's because of the demand in these offices that is a priority uh, in our in our system. Uh, in, in juvenile matters, they have a priority over all other cases, and because there is a specific structure, they are trained. The, the CASA trained guardians are trained for this process. The, I, so, so what you're saying is that the numbers of cases in probate court that really relate to um, a, um, a family who placed their child with a relative because of perhaps parenting challenges. That, that those numbers in the various um, counties are, are less than the chins. Yes. To, okay. the, the short answer, maybe perhaps I should say the longer answer is <clears throat> that we recognize, when I say generally no, there are some times when a, a, a CASA trained guardian will be used in the domestic docket or the probate court, but we try to minimize that because of their need in this docket. And so when I have to say no, uh, I do it reluctantly, um, but I sometimes have to say no, so, you can't so, do it. So, you are the one who assigns, not you who, who runs the program. Somehow the problem cases end up coming to me, and to both of us, both of us. Yeah, I'm just trying to say, you know, who, you know um, who, who was making these decisions as to who was the, who was the, and the, the GALs and the CASAs, we are talking volunteers, trained volunteers. No question. Volunteers. So we are, so Every so, guardian we use, whether right. CASA trained or not, is a volunteer. So um, in other words, who is managing where these people go based on their skills, um, except in some cases you are making them. Sometimes the question will come from a, a guardian coordinator within a region to say the judge in the domestic docket has tried to assign a CASA trained guardian to a case. And so what we, what I have explained to the judges and uh, is that that judge should reach out to the coordinator and determine first of all if their individual caseloads allow them to consider taking on, for instance, a domestic case. And if so, it, is the person, is the guardian comfortable in taking on a case that they, they haven't been trained for? Their role 
in some respects is similar in terms of trying, trying to provide guidance, but they don't have anywhere near the resources that individuals working in, in the juvenile docket have. In other words, when you have a guardian in a, in a juvenile proceeding, there are attorneys for both parents and child, you have DCF, you have therapists, whatever, whatever the family needs in one form or another, they're there and the guardian is working as part of a team. When they are put in the domestic docket, well over 50% of the domestic docket is self-represented individuals. Um, and so when we're asking someone to get involved in that docket, they are pretty much on their own. It's a totally different role. Uh, the title may be the same, but the, what they have to do and what they have to work with are totally different. And so just recently, for instance, I had a, a court, um, there was a judge who was assigning, just assigning chins, if you will, uh, guardians to a domestic dog. And, and I said, you know, we can't do that unless you go to the coordinator, because what I heard from the coordinator, and this came through Rob to me, um, was that the individual assigned, one of them, for instance, had only been a guardian in this docket for a year and did not feel that they were prepared to take on a case of, of that nature um, and felt they didn't have a choice. Um, another person said, I, I just, my docket is so full that I can't take on any more cases. So there are situations where we will use them, but we want them, not just the judge to select someone or appoint someone, we want them to work through the coordinator to see if we can identify someone. Um, yeah, thank you, I realize I was I needed some more information. I apologize. Uh, Thank that. you. So it, it's, in, in a lot of respects, it's a patchwork. Uh, when you get into the domestic docket and the probate court, the probate courts over the years, you know, have, have, have um, relied on individuals uh, to perform that role of guardian. Um, but it's hard to tell what the demand is. I would be the first one to say that any contested case, be it domestic or, or probate, without a guardian is a nightmare for everyone. Um, so it's not that we're making light of the need. What we're trying to do and what we have been doing over the last few months and we're going forward with it, is to try to determine the demand in that probate court so we can determine how many guardians we need to be recruiting specifically for that docket. Um, my reaching out to the probate judges um, has resulted in really, a, at this point, a lack of data that I could come to you today and say that you know we need money for more guardians in the probate court or the domestic docket, and this is why. Mm -hmm. We just don't have that data, but we're embarking on a project now to try to determine what that demand is. And part of the problem is, you know, the example, best example I can give you is the domestic docket. Um, for instance, when I sat in Burlington, it had become part of the culture up there that experienced attorneys in the domestic docket would be willing to take on the role of guardian in another case. And that's who we relied on. Um, but uh, that's because of their experience in that docket. And, uh, so judges are in that docket are used to knowing that there aren't guardians available, so they don't ask, they don't expect people. And so <coughs> determining what that demand is, is is difficult, and that's what we've got to do to really explain to you and the legislature as a whole what the need is. If I wanted to understand why uh, Wyndham County has in that period of your report, Wyndham County had 205 chins, abused, and neglected kids. Bennington County, on the other side of the mountain, similar sized county, without an interstate highway, had 97. How would I find out why those two counties would be so, well, Wyndham County has 100% more going back to Larry Chris's testimony earlier, are we, have we got a bigger problem in Wyndham County than Bennington? Or is Bennington sending them to probate court? What is going on? Why, why would that be? 
you know, and I don't know how to, as a legislator, I don't know how to dig into these questions. But I would think that one of the groups who work with this on a regular basis would, would be asking why. How could that be? How could you be double? Did, did somebody, you know, I mean, they're in the same state. They're divided by a mountain. What? I know Brattleboro's rather hippie, but um, <laughs> and they, they use a lot more drugs than they do on the other side of the mountain. But, Thank you. Well, I've been talking with Senator White about that. Yeah. Um, but no, seriously, that stands out to me, and I as a legislator have, legislator have no idea how to get to the bottom of what is going on. Uh, we deal with the same thing in the judiciary, you know, in the adult system as well. You have cultural differences mm -hmm. from county to county. And, you know, that's one of the problems that I know you're trying to deal with. But doesn't that stand out to you as something rather odd? Uh, there's no question. Yes, and I wish I had it. Don't it. But how do we get the answer of why? Are they doing it better over there, or are they doing it better over there? So, I think these, you know, this has been the, kind of the topic of the entire, to me anyway, this problem. And we, a little state with a very small legislature, I can just see somebody in Congress having 50 people looking into this problem. We do. But seriously, I, I, who's responsible? I don't know who's responsible, but obviously that's a question that anyone involved in this process has to ask themselves. Yeah. Um, we, we have a, a hand from the audience. Kev Shatz, Commissioner Department of Children's Care. I just want to. I appreciate the question. I wish I had the analytic capacity to look deeper into those issues that exist all around the state, levels of differences in a variety of ways, and some of the data the court provides is helpful. I am hopeful that the UVM study that we discussed earlier that's looking at entry rates will also look, rather than just broadly as a state, will look at the geographic um, differences and help us understand the answer to your question. question do they have contract lawyers in public defender's offices in Newton County? Yes, uh, both counties have a staff office, and then both counties have conflict contracts. Right. So that's not the problem. Well, I mean, it may be a problem, but it's not. So it's the two state attorneys. Uh, yes, Larry? Our experience is that it typically has to do with practice in a district office versus practice in another district office. And the only way that anyone can find that out, and I'll, I'll respect, due respect to, to Ken, because he, he has a big system to manage, is you have a group of people, maybe it's the UVM study, they go in and they have access to the case files, and they pull them, and they look to see what really happened in this case. That's the only way you can find this out, but because of confidentiality, no one in the system gets to look at it. That's, that's the problem. It's sort of like asking Sherlock Holmes to solve a mystery, but he has to be deaf, dumb, and blind. Again, I, I think it's, in order to make the system work, we have to understand what we're doing. I mean, we don't have, do we have 14 different, or 12, in, in this case, 12 different systems of uh, dealing with abuse and neglect? So, it would, it would probably take a special um, analysis, a requirement, or we could ask for a special analysis to be able to go into the files in the individual um, offices and then to have specific criteria that we're looking at so that you can come out and say, these are the reasons. So, well, one of the questions I think it's really important you could saying, look at is how many of the kids in Bennington County are shifted to the probate court yeah. for guardianship issues versus in Wyndham County. Maybe it's different there. I don't know. Right. Maybe that is part of the UVM. Uh, 
$90,000. But is UVM well, maybe, structured maybe to do that right now? Maybe some of those interns no. that UVM is offering could look at that. But can, but they, can they go into the files? Probably can they or no, probably not. Believe. No, the answer to that is yes. We, they we can? Are, we yeah. are talking, sure. We, we have the capacity to enable them subject to confidentiality agreements to allow researchers to look at our files. That's not a problem. The issue, I think, Representative Pugh correctly identified, if I heard it correctly, the challenge in terms of the scope of that particular project, the amount of money, and exactly what they'll be able to do is a, certainly a different question. But to get at, you know, I, I don't want to belabor the point, I know we're moving forward, and that wasn't why you were here, but I, All right. I think it does point to something that we really need to, to find the answers for. Now maybe in two months, you know, in the next six month report, it might be somewhat different. But we've been looking at Franklin County, right now they're not, but Franklin County was close to Chittenden County in terms of numbers of years. Report a few years ago. Not even, not a few years ago. How long ago? Less was that? than only a year ago, I think. Time flies in my world. The only to get them more. I'm just, it was very recently. On the uh, one of the charts I handed out, uh, it shows fiscal 17, 18, and 19 for each of the counties, so you, you can see where they, where they were. And Franklin's, on this chart, the Franklin total is a lot. Yes. Oh, yeah. And it always is somewhat behind Shipman, but it's all, always hard. Yeah, we and that's what five, four or five times the population. <laughs> well, what is that? that I, what is the population of Franklin County? I forgot. Um, I know our county is like 137 hundred and thirty-seven. Yeah, uh, Franklin's less than. Yeah. <laughs> so that's. I go by senators. Franklin has two senators. So oh, there probably it is. Probably forty-five to fifty. At the moment. <clears throat> well, in this, yeah. Wyndham's pretty high. <laughs> I'm wondering if we could um, allow um, um, Rob and Brian the opportunity to, to complete their presentation. I, as I said, um, you may have specific questions for us. I, I just wanted to make sure that the committee had the, the current figures for case loads of the various types, the, the guardians that we use in, this, in this ju these juvenile dockets. And to make sure that you understand, if you have questions about the difference in the role they play in those other dockets, where there's no question, as I said, there's a demand for them, but we've got to we've got to do a better job of uh, training and recruiting in those dockets. But we need to have a better sense of what is the what is the, the demand. We know there's a need. It's a question of how much. How difficult is it to? Um find a guardian to get get these volunteers get volunteers and then to but train what, what yeah so maybe you could talk a little bit about the turnover rate and how you identify people and how they come in i know and how many hours yeah. how many people are I, I did it years ago but um, and i remember how i was pulled into it yeah, sure. By a friend who's an attorney. But That's how it happens sometimes. It does. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, for the record, I'm Rob Post. I am the program manager for the Vermont Guardian Lab Program. <clears throat> and currently, to answer that question, currently we have 336 active um, volunteers working primarily in the Chin Docket. <clears throat> um, recruitment of these volunteers is challenging. Um, beginning with the fact that we have a small population state to begin with and then whittling that down to people who are uh, have the time to do the job and have the um, capabilities and temperament and all those things that go along with being a good guard at Lytham makes that even harder. <clears throat> we uh, are always trying to recruit and <clears throat> train new volunteers. We have recently embarked on a branding campaign uh, through partnership with the National Cops Association, we applied and were granted some funds to do some advertising to bolster our social media presence and our website materials, and that is bearing some fruit. Uh, we have currently 12 guardians that are ready to be trained who will be attending our next training, which will be in December, and our applications are also up. We had 15 in just the last two weeks, which is actually quite high and a good sign. 
<clears throat> so hopefully bring those people on as soon as possible. And we just completed a training uh, with six new guardians who are now back in their counties mentoring in their respective courts. And that's how we, we go about recruiting them in all sorts of different ways. Like I mentioned, we do um, advertising and recruiting from an administrative level from our office in Montpelier, mostly radio advertising and things of that nature. And then the GL coordinators, as part of their job duties, is to recruit locally. And that, just like every other thing else in Vermont, really varies by county as far as strategy. Um, really depends on the county. Um, sometimes it works to go to co-op and sit there with a table and get people to talk to you that work. Other things might not work. So recruitment's a challenge, and we try to meet the challenge in creative in various ways is really how to characterize that what, part of What's the job. average age of the, you know, the high, the high, the low, and the average? Uh, yeah, I don't know the average age, but I will say uh, the vast majority of our volunteers are retirees. Okay. Um, this helps with the time factor that I had mentioned. Um, people with you no know, job and maybe grown children have more time to volunteer, so definitely that age bracket. I couldn't put a number on it, but retirement age, I think, is a safe way to put it. We don't have a lot of young people. Um, because well, the there. question is, do, uh, that, that's what was in my head, do we want to have young people because, for experience reasons? Yeah, we don't necessarily gravitate towards um, younger folks uh, for that reason. One of them is that they don't have, sometimes don't have a lot of life experience in order to give the recommendations they're required to do as part of their job. And also, younger people are busier. Um, they're often full-time employees or, we get a lot of people inquiring about being a guardian that are in school, uh, but they're looking for an experiential like opportunity and not a two-year commitment of being a volunteer guardian right item. They want experience, and that doesn't work out either. It's interesting, uh, Senator Sears referenced Wyndham County, and for whatever reasons, it sometimes varies from county to county, they have a tremendous number of guardians available to them. They, Either through their local recruitment, they just they just have probably I don't want to say more than Chittenden County or Franklin, but for a county that size, they have a tremendous uh, number of, of guardians that are available, which is interesting. The, the three maybe the guardians are working too well. That's it. <laughs> I'll let you draw that conclusion. Uh, on the three thirty six, that's covering all of these two thousand plus cases that are on the chart. Mm -hmm. Some of the guardians will have one or two cases, mm -hmm. others will take 10, 15. In other words, the, the, the individual caseloads vary tremendously among those guardians, either time or inclination. Um, and that's what makes it difficult to share them sometimes with other, uh, uh, the other dockets um, because of their commitment to this docket. Mm -hmm. and those that don't take many Chin's case and generally aren't interested in, in being involved in the other dockets. So there's a lot of factors that come into play. It's, it's interesting. So the, the people that the guardians are working with are, are probably much younger. Mm -hmm. And then you have an older population. Where, where, so what cultural differences do you see? Do you have to do any sort of discussion and weeding out about what, you know, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense? Because we're looking at some significant age differences, I think. And so you have some significant sort of life experiences and expectations, but how does that, how does that play out? I think it's more of a question for you. I'm, I'm looking for you. Just to clarify your question, are you asking how the older population works with the younger population when they have different values and different expectations, perhaps? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we try our best to um, train and inform the guardians of their sort of narrowly tailored scope of work, and that is to represent the best interests of kids in child welfare proceedings. Yeah. And they, this is not necessarily a mentorship program. Um, it's not like a big brother, big sister type situation where the guardians are spending time with the youth um, for any purpose of like bonding or creating a relationship. They interact with the youth for the specific purpose to ascertain whether or not what is happening in the proceeding is in their best interest, and that's it. So I think that avoids some of those issues of age gap or different things. And some of the some of the children they represent are nonverbal. I mean, we're talking about babies, 
and um, some of them are teenagers, and it, it all it depends. And that's part of the jail coordinator's job is to match a guardian with a case that makes sense. Some prefer to work with the older kids, have different experiences working at that age demographic. So they'll usually get assigned and other people will work with younger kids who better. So that's some of the interplay with the coordinator and what they do in their role. So you began by saying you want a name change. Is that something that we have to do or is that something that you can do? No, we asked to uh, change the name to CASA um, wherever it appears. And is that a step? Is that so? Again, my question is that a, something that you can do without statutory authority, or do you need a bill to be introduced? In no, order? we saw the <coughs> statutory authority. But what had happened last year was that, um, and Senator Sears knows because we discussed it in, in his committee, there was miscommunication uh, between. <coughs> Fill your office and the guardians as to what was behind this change in name. And um, so, so, in other words, there is a process in place. There is. That we need to renew the bill that and, and or or um, representative yes. um, grad is aware of, and you're yes. just yes. alerting us that you're going to. A bill passed the house to change the name. And oh, the time oh, voted for, I'm sure. Yeah, I know. I have it on the record. Um, no, when it got to the Senate people realized it had been passed who were guardians and they were upset that they hadn't been consulted. So the, this, the court magnanimously said, well, let's just wait till next okay. week. We'll give us time to talk to these folks. Okay. So now we have it. So we continue to talk. Okay. So they're continuing to talk. Mm -hmm. And they, they destroyed the roll call so you you know, it's really like anything else. They have become used. To, they are guardian ad litems, and even if we change the name to CASA, they're going to. I'm sure they're going to continue to call themselves guardian ad litems. What it helps us do also is to make sure that you know, other courts are looking for folks. We it's a quick way to identify the training that someone has had, okay. and so it, it helps us on different levels. Okay. Um, other questions over the what is. Happening. This was sort of framed as, um, you know, um, strengths and areas to grow or things that are rough edges. I, I think, as I said earlier, we are embarking on um, projects of determine the demand. Okay. Guardians, and that, that's our next step. We, I think, I think we're in pretty good shape with this docket that's in front of you, the juvenile docket, in terms mm -hmm. of we continue to recruit, but those efforts seem to be successful. So now we're going to uh, focus in on the other dockets and find out what they need in order to figure out what we need to do by way of recruitment and training. There. But, to, but so in terms of the, the narrow, the, the narrow but broad focus of this committee. You can proceed and go along, and there's not something that you are looking not for at this from point. the legislature in terms of other things. Not, not at this point with respect to, to guardians. So are you, uh, would you request that we say CASA instead of guardian? Yes. Okay, so that's the learning experience, all right? It's not going to be easy. <laughs> well, I'll remind you whenever I get the chance. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I keep thinking you need to do like be part of like a retirement planning and with all the various judicial and human service kinds of things have like a you know this is what you can do with your time. I what you can show up to all the retirement parties for every state employee there is and be right. there with, with a pamphlet. Oh. It's like we're retired now. Be guardian. <laughs> Great. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Um, the next um, piece that people were interested in that they identified was an update on truancy. And um, you know, you haven't moved. I haven't. Um, um, are you doing this by yourself? Or? I am. Okay. I'm going to try. But. <laughs> so, again, uh, for the record, in, uh, this is part of the agenda, Brian Rearson. Chief Superior Judge, and again, not
sure exactly what the committee is looking for. Let me just explain. I can judge, yep. you know, a few years ago, there was a major effort to try to deal with truancy in a different way. All the studies from other states indicate that a good indicator of somebody coming into custody is truancy, and it was a way to prevent that. And so there's been an effort, I know in DCF, I know in some of the courts, there's actually truancy courts. So I, if, you know, it's, to me, it's, it's one thing we can do that's very preventive um, to try to deal with truancy before it becomes a major problem. And many of, the, many of those problems are um, the result of miscommunication, um, blah, blah, blah. So I know in Bennington there's a truancy court. Um, we don't advertise it as a specialized court, but um, you know, it seems to help. Um, and, and Commissioner, I don't know if you're if hearing more specifically what the Senator is interested in, if at the end there's anything you want to add or not, please. So that was what I think that's what. And I think anyone that works in the system that we do recognizes the school to, unfortunately, the school to court pipeline that oftentimes happens. Delinquency. For the time that I've been involved <coughs> with the courts, truancy is probably one of the most neglected dockets historically. And it, it generally followed a pattern of schools reporting delinquencies. They usually let the kids slide that first half of the year and then they begin notifying the state's attorneys uh, towards the end of the, uh, the uh, year and then into the early winter. By the time the petitions would get filed, oftentimes it was in the spring, and it's too late for the courts to do anything except you know, wag your finger and I'll see you in September. There have been um, attempts over the years to try to come up with a, with a model uh, to do a better job. There's no question we need to do a better job. Um, Bennington is one of them, and um, it was not advertised to the point where I wasn't aware that it was going on. So I'm, <laughs> so I'm glad that you called for this to be on the agenda. Um, but they had a, a, apparently a project. For Sorry, a, I didn't. Let, I didn't I realize know, you didn't know. That's all right. No, no, I, I don't need to know everything. I hope he's not going to get in trouble. He's not going to get in any trouble because I'm told it's, I mean, it's, it's a success. Um, they've had it for about a year, a little more than a year, and they said they've had a good uh, results from it, or you know, good response from the community. Um, and in light of that, because he's a Rutland judge that started that, and all the judges in Bennington are Rutland, now one of the Rutland judges sitting in Rutland is trying to emulate that program in Rutland. And they are essentially court-driven uh, projects with the state's attorneys that um, is one vehicle for doing this. In, in my experience, one of the most successful programs, and for any of you that may sit on the Justice for Children Task Force this past spring, uh, the Lamoille uh, group has had a, a, a truancy project, and I think Marshall um, uh, was on one of the school boards up there, so he's probably more intimately familiar with the workings of the project. They took a different approach, and it was really community and school-based. We were literally the last resort, and by that I mean they went out and went to each of the, the uh, supervisory unions in, in that area and essentially, and Marshall, you correct me if I get off track here, but uh, recruited, uh, got funding from those schools to hire an individual to oversee essentially the truancy issues in all of those communities. And so they laid out a process where uh, after a certain number of days, five days, uh, they will be alerted uh, to the fact that somebody is missing. They don't get involved until a later stage, maybe 10 days uh, of truancy. And then at 20 days, uh, they will get really involved. I'll just give you some quick numbers because I know time is tight, but the numbers that they put together in this project um, are, are pretty amazing. Um, they started out, this is 2018, 2019 school year. Notification of a student being truant, that's five to 10 days absent, involved 320 students was the beginning 
in a number. They take their first, there's a total of 4,300 4, students in the three supervisory units, so 320 referrals to this program. And the intervals are five days absent, a documented attempt to make contact with a parent or guardian by the school. At 10 days absent, there's again a documented absence, support services offered by the school again, letter from the school, letter copied to this organization, the Moyle Valley Truancy Program, and a determination by that program at that stage and the school what needs to happen at that point. If the truancy gets up to 15 days absent, then the Lamoille Valley Project really gets involved in it. Uh, the letter goes to the family notifying them of uh, Lamoille Valley intervention. They hold a meeting with the student, the parents, the guardian, school, they develop a plan, figure out what this family needs. Uh, the superintendent seeks corroboration regarding the student's physical or mental fitness to attend school. Um, and then finally, when it gets to 20 days absent, um, the program works with the, the principal, the superintendent, and DCF is involved at that point. Uh, try to come up with a plan, and if not, it's referred to the state's attorney. So out of 4,300 people, 320 started um, in that year. By 15 days absent, that number of 320 had been reduced to 85 children. The 20 days absent, the number had been reduced to 29 students. And by the time the court petition was filed, 17 students from 11 families, 5% of the total from 320. But much like any of these specialty projects or courts that we deal with, it takes the community to support yeah. these. That's why we're struggling in some, as Senator Sears knows, in some treatment court dockets. They struggle not because somebody doesn't think it's a good idea, or it's, 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 it's like the court is encouraging it. The community has to be behind these projects to make it work. And I think this is fabulous. And um, Judge Person, given the fact that we seem to have someone who's I can just chime in with a little bit more of sort of what I think, uh, and for the record. For the record, uh, Marshall Paul, Deputy Defender General and Chief Juvenile Defender. Um, and perhaps more relevant in this case, former member of the Waterville School Board. Um, and I would just add that um, I think the real magic of this program and the reason that this program has been so successful and so incredibly successful, really, is the Loyal Truancy Project employs a dedicated social worker full time who does nothing but truancy issues. And really what was sort of missing from Judge Grierson's procedural explanation here is that when you start to approach 10 days absent, you have a social worker knocking on your door, and that's really what is making the difference. It's, you know, it's the, the meetings are really important. The structure is really important. The fact that it's consistent across the county, um, or within that, it's at, across the county, it's, it's very consistent. But what it really is, is that starting really early in the process, rather than it being something like happens in other counties where letters go home, letters go home, letters go home, petition gets filed, and then you wind up in court. So very early there's an intervention where a social worker is knocking on your door, and the social worker is a, not just sort of a, you know, consultative role, but is actually a, sort of in a boots on the ground. If they show up at your house at eight in the morning and you're not out of bed, they're gonna be standing there saying, get out of bed, let's get in the car, we're gonna get you to the school, um, we're going to move this along, and if you are refusing, that's going to change the course that this that the case takes. And because it's so there's so much active involvement, it be, it's very easy to tell early on in a case whether this is a case that needs to go in one direction or go in another direction. And the, the project, not just the social worker, but the other people at the Will Restorative Center, who sort of supervise this project, and I'd say mostly we're talking Heather Hobart and Becky Penberg, um, are not just involved at the level of the family and knocking on the door, but also finding out what the problems are and resolving them with the school. So they are prior to, because 
it's a lot of the same work that gets done in court. It's just being done long before the case goes to court. When we have truancy cases that go to court, it's a lot of work of essentially identifying why is this kid good not going to school. Most of the time, frankly, in the really tricky, sticky cases, it's not, it's not simple. It's not just a problem where the kid won't go to school. There's problems at the school that need to be resolved in order to accommodate the kid. It takes really the involvement and investment of everybody. And so there will be meetings with the schools, there will be negotiations, people will try to identify what could we be doing at the school to make it so that this kid will go to the school, while at the same time working at the home, saying what can we change at the home to make this kid go to the school. It's a, it's a really great program, and it's been incredibly successful. I was a attorney taking juvenile cases as a contract attorney um, as that program ramped up and as it really became effective, and it was really just a sea change in how truancy was treated by the court system because it used to be that the court system in Loyal County was not, sort of like everyone, not really well equipped to deal with truancy issues because that's not what courts are designed for. Um, you know, the tools that courts have are essentially take a kid into custody or don't take a kid into custody and a judge can sit on the bench and wag his finger at a kid. That's about all the tools they have. And this provided so much more to the point where We'd go for years where there'd be, you know, truancy petitions were so incredibly rare because this project was essentially solving these problems before they came into the court system. So it's a tremendous, and it, and it really was one of the things that was amazing about it. I was at the same time as I was a contract attorney, I was a school board member, and it really was a grassroots thing. They showed up at our school board meeting and they said, we want you to budget X amount of money. Um, they, they still, that was my question. They're using the past tense. Who pays for it? You know, I, I, well, so we're well, actually sure who pays for it. Well, the project in Lamoille County what? grew out of the Lamoille North District, and there was a shared position between Laraway and Lamoille North. And, and that's and, one way. And, and Tom would not wait five days. Tom was there after two days mm -hmm. to show up at, um, at yeah. the house. But so, but so it's no longer in. No, it's, it moved and was taken over by the Restorative Justice. And I'm 100% oh, okay. sure how oh, okay. it's coming down. Yeah. Since, since we've consolidated, I'm no longer on the school yeah, board. No, no, it no, started no. as a school project. I just find out who pays for it. It started as a school, it, um, I, I, it, and it moved to the Restorative Justice. I'm going to think as, as, as recently as four years ago, which is when I was last on the school board, school boards were still kicking in money to it, whether we were funding the whole thing or not. And I'm not sure he's supposed to answer. Oh, yeah. um, we, we got another help. I answer that question because I think Mark is absolutely right that it is the Lamoille Community Restored Just Center deserves a great amount of credit because what they did is figure out how to blend monies. So, and the Barge Program through DCF, the Balance and Restorative Justice Program, is is what we give money to Lamoille to have a range of programs, including addressing truancy, and that happens actually throughout the state. But what Lamoille did very effectively was work with, and, and it sounds like there was some history, works with the local schools, so they also kicked in some money to enable Lamoille to have this robust program. It, it, it started before as a um, part-time position funded through the school district mm -hmm. at Lamoille North. And it was a shared position, and and then that moved um, um, as a shared position there. Um, with um, and Laraway had a presence in it, and I can't remember exactly how much money they kicked in, but um, Tom would go um, and didn't wait. It wasn't five days; it was more like two days. <laughs> Tom was at their door going, "Are you up?" I know you're in there. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and what I what I am struck by, I guess I want to say, is we even started this day with focusing on um, there's trouble, and we've gone to court, right? And um, we have to fix the court process, or we have to do that. And what what has been discussed or shared right now in terms of what is working on the currency project is, you know, okay, that's the court maybe, but really what we're talking about is the community, right. and that it's not just the school, it's not just the family, it's not just DCF, it is in fact the community coming together and figuring out um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a proxy, there's a proxy if there's something's not right, and the proxy in this example is the kid's not going to school. 
And um, so the community, in a sense, is rallying around by where they're putting their money and owning the, the problem. And they're not waiting for um, the public defender or the judge, or for that matter, coming into custody right. to get um, help. And just to be clear, that really is so effective in a large part because truancy in particular, like separate from the rest of child welfare issues, is it's really the judicial system, public defenders, judges, prosecutors, we lack the tools. They, they just aren't, it's not a very effective process. I mean, we do it, you know, if you give us a truancy case, we're gonna have a truancy case. It's about the least effective way to handle truancy is by taking, I, I mean, honestly, one of the things that cracks me up in truancy cases is how often we have to go and pull kids out of school to take them to court for truancy. Uh, we do that a lot. Yeah. I, I really like it when then we were suspended because we didn't go to school. <laughs> so, but if we were going to take this program the way it's currently structured, because you have to have the linkage, as, as, as Representative Pugh said, you have to have a linkage with the school and then with the community in order to make it, I would think, to make it highly effective and cost effective. So, how do we spread this? You don't, I'm thinking, you know, we, we write bills. We, we spread things by writing bills and, 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 and directing. And these folks find the money. Uh, right? And, yeah, and right. we direct the appropriations process, so DCF might take a little piece of their money that, that goes to the community. Richie. It's targeted. Sorry, but, oh. you know, so seriously, though, how do you, you give up some of your court money? I, I mean, I can say this because I heard you scheduling your next meetings, but you should talk to Heather Hogarth. Get Heather Hogarth. Yes, you bring, okay. bring okay. them in. Okay. Because they, they can, they know more about this than we know, and they are really, they, I mean, they, they're the people who built this program from the ground up, and they know how to build it, and they know how to get people invested in it. And then we give it to the, to the judicial system, we give it to the defender's office, and let you do it. It's not no. us, it's no. them. I'm kidding. No, no I think it's us. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and I'm going to show my age, but when I um, was a social worker in the field, you did truancy work? Uh, we didn't call it truancy work. What did you call it? Whatever it takes. And we would do, I mean, there was a, you know, whatever time of the day or night you went to the family's house to do stuff, um, and whether it was to get the kid up, whether it was to put the kid to bed, whether, you know. Yeah. Um. I think what's significant is that you, throughout the state, we have small programs mm -hmm. that deal with really? specific things and we don't have an inventory, really, of what we're right. doing mm -hmm. right. And particularly with school issues, mm -hmm. whether it be truancy, suspension, mm -hmm. expulsion, fights in school, whatever it is, it's much better dealt with in a restorative justice manner. And many of the community justice centers are now more involved mm -hmm. in that mm -hmm. function than they ever were before. And that's keeping a lot of kids out of custody, a lot of kids out of trouble. So it's actually money well spent. In Bennington, they just started a after school drop by um, program. The kids are coming there, watch TV, mm -hmm. eat popcorn. I don't know where they but, get all the popcorn. I think in, in this case, the reason it got started so well is because the school, um, the largest school district had already bought it. Mm -hmm. and, I, um, I think that, well, that you'll find that these yeah, community uh, justice centers and school districts, yeah. it was like pulling teeth. Uh, Senator Campion and I introduced a bill on school expulsion and um, suspension. That's right. And I mean, I'm telling you, you, you couldn't believe the education establishment. If you think DCF and others have problems, when you try to do something in education, you right. watch those folks well, come well, in. Well, you know, they don't want to okay. do any human services work. Well, and, and yet. Well, it's not even human I, services. But I, I think, oh, one, sorry. One, I, do, I think your initial point, which was we have a lot of um, well. in, um, programs that seem to be working and addressing issues that get children and families, um, children at risk and families and we can think identify them. Um, no, no, I don't think you are. But what I'm what I am also saying is and I don't know if Chittenden County is um, a outlier or 
Howard Center is an outlier. Howard Center has school social workers in every single except one underhill ID, has a social worker in every single solitary Maybe school. You're um, they school. Are, I don't know that, I mean, I don't know, they're not focused primarily on truancy, so I, I don't know how they get involved with that, but this is not, this is different from um, a person who is being a clinician and working, um, shall I say, individual therapy, but more of what we are talking about. And so that's, um, um, it may be that, that, that because of the size and breadth of that community mental health center that they're able to do some things which in your district and others it is um, the restorative justice. That if you, it, mm -hmm. if you want, um, I can get the school district and I can get Heather or um, Becky to come and talk about it. during oh, the session. session. Yeah, it would we'll be. find out now. Um, I, am, I am aware that we're going to begin to lose people. Yep. Um, and I time. didn't know if folks here got what they wanted and needed in terms of um, input and update around um, truancy and around GALs and CASA. It's CASA. CASA. CASAs. CASAs. Close. Um, and, I just um, want him to say it. <laughs> I'm not going to say it. Okay. Um, um, Tony Carter Cox, he said to do it. He'll do it. Oh, oh, and can, and before we, um, can you want to add something? We wanted to, and I just want to be clear that Truancy is a significant part of our large caseload. So, in effect, DCF is putting a lot of resources into truancy. And it's consistent with everything Judge Pearson and Marshall and you all have said. Clearly, courts are and should be a very last resort. So, are you saying, are you saying that we have children in custody for which the, um, and the precipitating? Um, reason is they didn't go to school? So the answer, I hope, it is still no, but it is a provision in the law that allows it, which is how in the chin, there can be chins proceeding, because I think it's part D, subsection D, that allows that. But none of us, including clearly the Commissioner of DCF, does not want a child coming into state custody because of truancy. All of these other approaches make much more sense in terms of long-term uh, benefit to the youth. We want kids to be successful. Oh, well, well, I guess he's going to say, oh, but I have heard from mm -hmm. parents no, and no, that is yeah. why they yeah, are No, there. no, actually what I was going to say is the beauty of what was just described is that there's beauty for the parent too. Because you try being a parent who's under DOC supervision and you have a three o'clock mandatory meeting, but DCS says you've got to be at the bus stop to pick up your child at three o'clock. Mm -hmm. And corrections doesn't recognize DCF and DCF doesn't recognize corrections. And if you've got that kind of a community meeting, then the parents can bring those issues to the table and solutions can come up. In all likelihood, corrections needs to change the time of the meeting. But you try to go to corrections and tell them that. Well, the, I, I want to say yeah. that the communication between departments within the Agency of Human Services and outside has been something that um, is challenging. Hell, it's challenging to get us in the yeah. same room at the same time. Um, it's been identified. It's been something that I think people are trying to work on. It's certainly not helped by a um, um, technology that is older than I am. But this helps. This kind of approach really uh, does because those issues that you're on the Oh, stop. Shot. So what I was going to say, I was just talking to Judge Gerson that you know the Justice for Children's Task Force recognized the issue of truancy and frankly that the numbers had started to go up in terms of court and although recently they went down a little bit, which is certainly good news. But there, there is a subcommittee of that um, uh, Justice for Children Task Force that is going to be making recommendations. I do think they're going to focus on uh, replicating the Lamoille uh, program, which I, again I think is a really good thing. And what I would ask, if you are going to have continued discussions, let's in, and I think Senator Weston indicated, let's include the schools or okay. AOE because you they to, are you have a to. really have critical to. part yeah. of this well, conversation. It's true it's from school. Well, understood. But again, I'm not. Again, Lamoille is, a, I think, an outlier in, yeah. in, in a complementary way in stepping up and being involved. I'm not sure that that is consistently true around the state. 